Section 28 of Essays and Reviews by Charles Hodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Theology of the Intellect and That of the Feelings, Article 1, Part 1. Footnote. The Theology of the Intellect and That of the Feelings, a discourse before the Convention of the Congregational Ministers of New England, in Brattle Street Meeting House, Boston, May 30th, 1850, by Edwards A. Park, Professor in Andover Theological Seminary. Princeton Review, October, 1850. End footnote. The normal authority of the scripture is one of the subjects about which, at the present time, the mind of the church is most seriously agitated. The old doctrine of the plenary inspiration and consequent infallibility of the written word is still held by the great body of believers. It is assailed, however, from various quarters and in different ways. Some of these assaults are from avowed enemies, some from pretended friends, and others from those who are sincere in thinking they are doing God's service in making his word more pliant, so that it may accommodate itself the more readily, not to science but to the theories of scientific men, not to philosophy but to the speculations of philosophers. The form of these attacks is constantly varying. The age of naked rationalism is almost over. That system is dying of a want of heart. Its disillusion is being hastened by the contempt even of the world. It is no longer the mode to make common sense the standard of all truth. Since the discovery of the Anschauungsvermögen, men see things in their essence. The institutional consciousness has superseded the discursive understanding. The rationalists have given place to transcendentalists. In the hands of many of the latter, the scriptures share the same fate which has overtaken the outward world. As the material is but the manifestation of the spiritual, so the facts and doctrines of the Bible are the mere forms of the spirit of Christianity, and if you have the spirit, it matters not what form it takes. These gifted ones, therefore, can afford to be very liberal. They see in Christianity, as in all things else, a manifestation of what is real. They pity, but can bear with, those who lay stress on the historical facts and doctrinal assertions of the scriptures. They look on them as occupying a lower position and as belonging to a receding period. Still men can have the substance in that form as well as in another. The misfortune is that they persist in considering the form to be the substance, or at least inseparable from it. They do not see that as the principle of vegetable life is as vigorous now as when it was expressed in forms extant only in fossils, and would continue unimpaired, though the whole existing flora should perish, so Christianity would flourish uninjured, though the New Testament should turn out to be a fable. This theory has more forms than one, and has many advocates who are not prepared to take it in its full results. Neither is it confined to Germany. With most of the productions of that teeming soil, it is in the process of transplanting. Shoots have been set out, and assiduously watered in England and America, which bid fair to live and bear fruit. The doctrine that Christianity consists not in propositions, it is life in the soul, and a life independent of the propositions, of necessity supersedes the authority, if not the necessity, of the scriptures. This doctrine, variously modified, is one of the forms in which the word of God is made of none effect. Another theory, intimately related to one just referred to, is the doctrine that inspiration differs in degree, but not in nature, from the spiritual illumination which ordinary men enjoy. Just in proportion as the religious consciousness is elevated, the intuition of divine things is enlarged and rendered more distinct. If sanctification were perfect, religious knowledge would be perfect. Let there be a due purification of the moral nature, says Morel, a perfect harmony of the spiritual being with the mind of God, a removal of all inward disturbances from the breast, and what is to prevent or disturb this immediate intuition of divine things. Page 174. Footnote. Morel is a very superior man. He stands among the first rank of reproducing, as distinguished from producing minds, his book is a simple reproduction of the doctrines of the German school to which he is addicted, but it is remarkably clear, well digested, and consistent. 
he understands himself and his masters. This is a great deal. Still, he is but an intelligent pupil, and those who wish to understand the theory which he presents would do well to study it in the writings of its authors. They will find it there in its nakedness, freed from those delicate concealments which a traditionary faith has imposed on Mr. Morell. End footnote. The inspiration of the sacred writings resembles, he tells us, that of men of genius. The natural philosopher is so in harmony with nature that he has a sort of intuition of her laws. The poet, from sympathy with his fellow men, can unfold the workings of the human breast, and so good men, from congeniality with God, can see the things of God. Of course, the trustworthiness of the sacred writers differs with their goodness. Those of the Old Testament, standing on a much lower level of moral culture than those of the New, are proportionally below them in authority. The weight due to what these writers say depends not only on their relative goodness, but also on the subjects of which they treat. Beyond the sphere of moral and religious truths, they can have no particular authority, because to that sphere the intuitions of the religious consciousness are of necessity confined. The greater part of the Bible, therefore, is not inspired, even in this low sense of the term, and as to the rest it is not the word of God, it is merely the word of good men. It has at best but a human and not a divine authority. Except, indeed, for those who repudiate the distinction between human and divine, which is the case with the real authors of this system. We are, however, speaking of this theory as it is presented by professed theists. It has appeared under three forms, according to the three different views entertained of the Holy Spirit, to whom this inspiration is referred. If by that term is understood the universal efficiency of God, then all men are inspired, who, under the influence of the general providence of God, have their religious consciousness specially elevated. This is the kind of revelation and inspiration which many claim for heathen sages and concede to Christian apostles. But if the Holy Spirit be regarded as the forming, animating, and governing principle of the Christian Church, then inspiration is confined to those within the Church, and belongs to all its members in proportion to their susceptibility to this pervading principle. Again, if the Holy Spirit be recognized as a divine person, dispensing his gifts to each one severally as he wills, inspiration may be a still more restricted gift, but its essential nature remains the same. It is that purifying influence of the Spirit upon the mind which enables it to see the things of God. It is simply spiritual illumination granted to all believers, to each according to his measure. To the apostles it may be conceded in greater fullness than to any others, but to none perfectly. The Bible is not the word of God, though it contains the aspirations, the convictions, the outgoings of heart of men worthy of all reverence for their piety. The distinction between the scriptures and uncanonical writings of pious men is simply as to the degree of their piety, or their relative advantages of knowledge. It is not our business to discuss this theory of inspiration. We speak of it as one of the modes in which the authority of the Bible is, in the present age, assailed. Under the same general category must be classed the beautiful solo of Dr. Bushnell. He endeavoured to seduce us from cleaving to the letter of the Scriptures by telling us the Bible was but a picture or a poem that we need as little to know its dogmas as the pigments of an artist. The aesthetic impression was the end designed, which was to be reached, not through the logical understanding, but the imagination. It was not a creed men needed, or about which they should contend. All creeds are ultimately alike. It is of no use, however, to score the notes of a dying swan, as the strain cannot be repeated except by another swan in Articulo Mortis. Dr. Bushnell has had his predecessors. A friend of ours, when in Germany, had Schleiermacher's Reden über die Religion put into his hands. When asked what he thought of those celebrated discourses, he modestly confessed he could not understand them. Understand them, said his friend, that is not the point. Did you not feel them? We are sincerely sorry to be obliged to speak of Professor Park's sermon, which was listened to with unbounded admiration, and the fame of which has gone through the land. Footnote. While writing, we have received a copy of the third thousand of this discourse. End footnote. As inimical to the proper authority of the word of God. But, if it is right in him to publish such an attack on doctrines long held sacred, 
it must be right in those who believe those doctrines to raise their protest against it. We are far from supposing that the author regards his theory as subversive of the authority of the Bible. He has obviously adopted it as a convenient way of getting rid of certain doctrines which stand out far too prominently in the scripture and are too deeply impressed on the hearts of God's people to allow of their being denied. It must be conceded that they are in the Bible. To reconcile this concession with their rejection, he proposes the distinction between the theology of feeling and that of the intellect. There are two modes of apprehending and presenting truth. The one by the logical consciousness, to use the convenient nomenclature of the day, that it may be understood. The other by the intuitional consciousness, that it may be felt. These modes do not necessarily agree, they may often conflict, so that what is true in the one may be false in the other. If an assertion of scripture commends itself to our reason, we refer it to the theology of the intellect and admit its truth. If it clashes with any of our preconceived opinions, we can refer it to the theology of the feelings and deny its truth for the intellect. In this way, it is obvious any unpalatable doctrine may be got rid of, but no less obviously at the expense of the authority of the word of God. There is another advantage of this theory of which the professor probably did not think. It enables a man to profess his faith in doctrines which he does not believe. Dr. Bushnell could sign any creed by help of that chemistry of thought which makes all creeds alike. Professor Park's theory will allow a man to assert contradictory propositions. If asked, do you believe that Christ satisfied the justice of God, he can say, yes, for it is true to his feelings and he can say no because it is false to his intellect. A judicious use of this method will carry a man a great way. This whole discourse, we think, will strike the reader as a set of variations on the old theme, what is true in religion is false in philosophy, and the tearful German, of whom our author speaks, who said, in my heart I am a Christian, while in my head I am a philosopher, might find great comfort in the doctrine here propounded. He might learn that his condition, instead of a morbid, was in fact the normal one, as what is true to the feelings is often false to the intellect. We propose to give a brief analysis of this sermon, and then, in as few words as possible, endeavour to estimate its character. The sermon is founded upon Genesis 6.6 6 and 1 Samuel 15.29. In the former passage, it is said, It repented the Lord, and in the latter, God is not a man that he should repent. Here are two assertions in direct conflict, God repented and God cannot repent. Both must be true. But how are they to be reconciled? The sermon proposes to give the answer and to show how the same proposition may be both affirmed and denied. Our author begins by telling us of a father who, in teaching astronomy to his child, produced a false impression by presenting the truth, while the mother produced a correct impression by teaching error. This, if it means anything to the purpose, is rather ominous as a commencement. A right impression is the end to be aimed at in all instruction, and if the principle implied in this illustration be correct, we must discard the fundamental maxim in religion, truth is in order to holiness, and assume that error is better adapted to that purpose, a principle on which Romanists have for ages acted in their crass misrepresentations of divine things in order to impress the minds of the people but we must proceed with our analysis. Quote, the theology of the intellect, we are told, conforms to the laws, subserves the wants, and secures the approval of our intuitive and deductive powers. It includes the decisions of the judgment, of the perceptive part of conscience and taste, indeed of all the faculties which are essential to the reasoning process. It is the theology of speculation, and therefore comprehends the truth just as it is, unmodified by excitements of feeling. It is received as accurate, not in its spirit only, but in its letter also. End quote. Page 534. It demands evidence. It prefers general to individual statements, the abstract to the concrete, the literal to the figurative. Its aim is not to be impressive, but intelligible and defensible. For example, it affirms that he who united in his person a human body, a human soul, and a divine spirit, expired on the cross. But it does not originate the phrase that the soul expired, nor that God the mighty maker died. Quote, it would never suggest the unqualified remark, 
that Christ has fully paid the debt of sinners, for it declares that this debt may be justly claimed from them, nor that he suffered the whole punishment which they deserve, for it teaches that this punishment may still be righteously inflicted on themselves, nor that he has entirely satisfied the law, for it insists that the demands of the law are yet in force. End quote. It gives origin to quote, no metaphor so bold and so liable to disfigure our idea of the divine equity as that heaven imputes the crime of one man to millions of his descendants, and then imputes their myriad sins to him who is harmless and undefiled. It is suited not for eloquent appeals, but for calm, controversial treatises and bodies of divinity, not so well for the hymn-book as for the catechism, not so well for the liturgy as for the creed. End quote. Page 535. We must pause here for a moment. It so happens that all the illustrations which our author gives of modes of expression which the theology of the intellect would not adopt are the products of that theology. They are the language of speculation, of theory of the intellect, as distinguished from the feelings, that Christ bore our punishment, that he satisfied the law, that Adam's sin is imputed to us, and our sins to Christ, are all generalizations of the intellect. They are summations of the manifold and diversified representations of Scripture. They are abstract propositions embodying the truth presented in the figures, facts, and didactic assertions found in the sacred writing. It would be impossible to pick out of the whole range of theological statements any which are less impassioned, or which are more purely addressed to the intellect. They have been framed for the very purpose of being intelligible and defensible. They answer every criterion the author himself proposes for distinguishing the language of the intellect from that of the feeling. Accordingly, these are the precise representations given in catechisms, in calm, controversial treatises and bodies of divinity for strictly didactic purposes. They are found in the accurately worded and carefully balanced confessions of faith designed to state with all possible precision the intellectual propositions to be received as true. These are the very representations, moreover, which have been held up to reproach as theoretical, as philosophy introduced into the Bible. Whether they are correct or incorrect is not now the question. What we assert is that if there be any such thing as the theology of the intellect, any propositions framed for the purpose of satisfying the demands of the intelligence, any purely abstract and didactic formulae, these are they. Yet Professor Park, simply because he does not recognize them as true, puts them under the category of feeling and represents them as passionate expressions designed not to be intelligible but impressive, addressed not to the intellect but to the emotions. The theology of the feelings is declared to be the form of belief which is suggested by and adapted to the wants of the well-trained heart. It is embraced as involving the substance of the truth, although when literally interpreted it may or may not be false. It studies not the exact proportions of doctrine, but gives special prominence to those features which are thought to be most grateful to the sensibilities. It insists not on dialectical argument, but receives whatever the healthy affections crave. Page 535. It sacrifices abstract remarks to visible and tangible images. It is satisfied with vague, indefinite representations. Page 536. For example, instead of saying God can do all things which are the objects of power, he says, He spake and it was done. Instead of saying that the providence of God comprehends all events, it says, the children of men put their trust under the cover of Jehovah's wings. To keep back the Jews from the vices and idolatry of their neighbors, it plied them with a stern theology, which represented God as jealous and angry, and armed with bow, arrows, and glittering sword. But when they needed a soothing influence, they were told that the Lord feedeth his flock like a shepherd. It represents Christians as united to their Lord as the branch to the vine, or the members to the head, but it does not mean to have these endearing words metamorphosed into an intellectual theory of our oneness with Christ, for without another end in view it teaches that he is distinct from us as a captain from his soldiers. The free theology of the feelings is ill-fitted for didactic or controversial treatises or doctrinal standards. Anything, everything, can be proved from the writings of those addicted to its use, 
because they indict sentences congenial with an excited heart, but false as expressions of deliberate opinion. Page 537. This is the theology of and for our sensitive nature, of and for the normal emotion, affection, passion. It is, moreover, permanent. Ancient philosophy has perished, ancient poetry is as fresh as ever. So the theology of reason changes, theory chases theory, Quote, but the theology of the heart, letting the minor inaccuracies go for the sake of holding strongly upon the substance of doctrine, need not always accommodate itself to scientific changes, but may often use its old statements, even if, when literally understood, they be incorrect. Footnote. This is a rather dangerous principle. Röhr, superintendent of Weimar, though a pure deist, admitting nothing but the doctrines of natural religion, still insisted on the propriety of retaining the language and current representations of orthodox Christians, and telling the people in his public ministrations that Christ was the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, that men are saved by his blood. He did not think it necessary that the language designed to move the people should accommodate itself to scientific changes, even when, if literally understood, i.e., if understood according to its true import, it was incorrect. It is easy to see what latitude in saying one thing and meaning another this principle will allow. End footnote. And it thus abides permanent, as are the main impressions of the truth. End quote. Page 539. We must again pause in our analysis. If there be any such thing as the theology of the feelings as distinct from that of the intellect, the passages cited above neither prove nor illustrate it. Our author represents the feelings as expressing themselves in figures and demanding visible and tangible images. We question the correctness of this statement. The highest language of emotion is generally simple. Nothing satisfies the mind when under great excitement but literal or perfectly intelligible expressions. Then is not the time for rhetorical phrases. There is a lower state of feeling, a placid calmness, which delights in poetic imagery which at once satisfies the feelings and excites the imagination, and thus becomes the vehicle of moral and aesthetic emotions combined. The emotions of terror and sublimity also, as they are commonly excited through the imagination, naturally clothe themselves in imaginative language. But the moral, religious, and social affections, when strongly moved, commonly demand the simplest form of utterance. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, is the language of seraphic devotion, yet what more simple? The loving-kindness of the Lord is over all his works, is surely as much the language of feeling, and tends as directly to excite gratitude and confidence, as saying, The Lord is my shepherd. The most pathetic lamentation upon record is that of David over his son Absalom, which is indeed an apostrophe, but nothing can be freer from tropical expression. How simple also is the language of penitence, as recorded in the Bible. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. Behold, I am vile, what shall I answer thee? O my God, I am ashamed, and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. Admitting, however, that figurative language is the usual vehicle of emotion, this affords no foundation for the distinction between the theology of feeling and the theology of the intellect, the one vague and inaccurate, the other precise and exact, for, in the first place, figurative language is just as definite in its meaning and just as intelligible as the most literal. After the Church had been struggling for centuries to find language sufficiently precise to express distinctly its consciousness respecting the person of Christ, it adopted the figurative language of the Athanasian Creed, God of God, light of light, begotten and not made. Calling God our shepherd presents as definite an idea to the mind as the most literal form of expression, to say that God is angry or jealous expresses as clearly the truth that his nature is opposed to sin as the most abstract terms could do. We have here no evidence of two kinds of theology, the one affirming what the other denies, the one true to the feelings and false to the intellect, and the reverse. The two passages on which this sermon is founded, chosen for the purpose of illustrating this theory, might be selected to show that it is without foundation. The declarations God repented and God cannot repent do not belong to different categories. The one is not the language of feeling and the other of the intelligence. The one does not affirm what the other denies, both are figurative. 
both are intelligible. The one, in its connection, expresses God's disapprobation of sin, the other his immutability. The one addresses the sensibilities as much as the other, and the one is as much directed to the intellect as the other. To found two conflicting kinds of theology on such passages as these is as unreasonable as it would be to build two systems of anthropology on the verbally contradictory propositions constantly used about men. We say a man is a lion, and we say he is not a quadruped. Do these assertions require a new theory of psychology, or even a new theory of interpretation in order to bring them into harmony? Figurative language, when interpreted literally, will, of course, express what is false to the intellect, but it will, in that case, be no less false to the taste and to the feelings. Such language, when interpreted according to the established usage, and made to mean what it was intended to express, is not only definite in its import, but it never expresses what is false to the intellect. The feelings demand truth in their object, and no utterance is natural or effective as the language of emotion which does not satisfy the understanding. Saying God repents, that he is jealous, that he is our shepherd, that men hide under the shadow of his wings, are true to the intelligence in the precise sense in which they are true to the feelings, and it is only so far as they are true to the former that they are effective or appropriate to the latter. It is because calling God our shepherd presents the idea of a person exercising a kind care over us, that it has the power to move the affections. If it presented any conception inconsistent with the truth, it would grate on the feelings, as much as it would offend the intellect. We object, therefore, to our author's exposition of this doctrine, first because much that he cites as the language of feeling is incorrectly cited, and secondly because granting his premises, his conclusion does not follow. A third objection is that he is perfectly arbitrary in the application of his theory. Because figurative language is not to be interpreted literally, the Sicinian infers that all that is said in Scripture in reference to the sacrificial nature of Christ's death is to be understood as expressing nothing more than the truth that he died for the benefit of others. When the patriot dies for his country, or a mother wears herself out in the service of her child, we are wont to say they sacrifice themselves for the object of their affection. This deceives no one. It expresses the simple truth that they died for the good of others. Whether this is all that the scriptures mean when they call Christ a sacrifice is not to be determined by settling the general principle that figures are not to be interpreted according to the letter. That is conceded. But figures have a meaning which is not to be explained away at pleasure. Professor Park would object to this exposition of the design of Christ's death not by insisting that figurative language is to be interpreted literally, but by showing that these figures are designed to teach more than the Sicinian is willing to admit. In like manner we say that, if we were disposed to admit the distinction between the theology of the feelings and that of the intellect, as equivalent to that between figurative and literal language, or, as our author says, between poetry and prose, we should still object to his application of his principle. He is just as arbitrary in explaining away the scriptural representations of original sin, of the satisfaction of divine justice by the sacrifice of Christ, as the Sicinian is in the application of his principle. He just as obviously violates the established laws of language, and just as plainly substitutes the speculations of his own mind for the teachings of the word of God. Entirely irrespective, therefore, of the validity of our author's theory, we object to this sermon that it discards as the language of emotion, historical, didactic, argumentative statements, that it discards as the language of emotion, historical, didactic, argumentative statements, and in short, everything he is not willing to receive, as far as appears, for no other reason and by no other rule than his own repugnance to what is thus presented. End of section 28《セクション29 of Essays and Reviews by Charles Hodge》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Theology of the Intellect and That of the Feelings, Article 1, Part 2 Having considered some of the differences between the emotive and intellectual theology, the author adverts to the influence which the one exerts over the other, and first, the theology of the intellect illustrates and vivifies itself by that of the feelings, 
We must add a body, he says, to the soul of a doctrine whenever we would make it palpable and enlivening. The whole doctrine of the spiritual world is one that requires to be rendered tangible by embodiment. An intellectual view is too general to be embraced by the feelings. They are balked with the notion of a spaceless, formless existence continuing between death and the resurrection. Page 540. In the second place, the theology of the intellect enlarges and improves that of the feelings, and is also enlarged and improved by it. The more extensive and accurate are our views of literal truth, so much the more numerous and salutary are the forms which it may assume for enlisting the affections. It is a tendency of pietism to undervalue the human intellect for the sake of exalting the affections, as if the reason had fallen deeper than the will. It cannot be a pious act to underrate those powers which are given by him who made the soul in his image. We must speculate. The heart is famished by an idle intellect. When fed by an inquiring mind, it is enlivened and reaches out for an expanded faith. The theology of reason not only amends and amplifies that of the affections, it is also improved and enlarged by it. When a feeling is constitutional and cannot but be approved, it furnishes data to the intellect by means of which it may add new materials to its dogmatic system. The doctrines which concentrate in and around a vicarious atonement are so fitted to the appetences of a sanctified heart as to gain the favour of the logician, precisely as the coincidence of some geological or astronomical theories with the phenomena of the earth or sky is part of the syllogism which has these theories for its conclusion. The fact that the faithful in all ages concur in one substance of belief is a proof of the correctness of their faith. The church is not infallible in her bodies of divinity, nor her creeds, nor catechisms, nor any logical formula, but underneath all there lies a grand substance of doctrine, around which the feelings of all reverent men cling ever and everywhere, and which must be right, for it is precisely adjusted to the soul, and the soul was made for it. These universal feelings provide a test for our faith. Whenever our representations fail to accord with those feelings, something must be wrong. Quote, our sensitive nature is sometimes a kind of instinct which anticipates many truths, incites the mind to search for them, intimates the process of investigation, and remains unsatisfied until it finds the object towards which it gropes its way. End quote. But while the theology of reason derives aid from the impulses of emotion, it maintains its ascendancy over them. In all investigations for truth, the intellect must be the authoritative power employing the sensibilities as indices of right doctrine, but surveying and superintending them from its commanding elevation. Pages 543 to 546. In the third place, the theology of the intellect explains that of the feeling into essential agreement with all the constitutional demands of the soul. It does this by collecting all the discordant representations which the heart allows, and eliciting the one self-consistent principle which underlies them. The Bible represents the heart sometimes as stone, sometimes as flesh, sometimes as dead, sometimes alive, sometimes as needing to be purified by God, sometimes as able to purify itself, etc., etc. These expressions, literally understood, are dissonant. The intellect adduces light from these repugnant phrases and reconciles them into the doctrine, quote, that the character of our race needs an essential transformation by an interposed influence of God, end quote. Page 547. Certainly a very genteel way of expressing the matter, which need offend no one, Jew or Gentile, Augustine or Pelagius. All may say that much, and make it mean more or less at pleasure. If such is the sublimation to which the theology of the intellect is to subject the doctrines of the Bible, they will soon be dissipated into thin air. Another illustration is borrowed from the heart's phrases respecting its ability. Sometimes the man of God longs to abase himself and exclaims without one modifying word, I am too frail for my responsibilities and have no power to do what is required of me. At another time he says, I know thee, that thou art not a hard master, exacting of me duties which I have no power to discharge, but thou attemperest thy law to my strength, and at no time imposest upon me a heavier burden than thou at that very time makest me able to bear. 
the reason seeks out some principle to reconcile these and similar contradictions, and finds it, as Professor Park thinks, in the doctrine that man, with no extraordinary aid from divine grace, is fully set in those wayward preferences which are an abuse of his freedom. His unvaried wrong choices imply a full, unremitted natural power of choosing right. The emotive theology, therefore, when it affirms this power, is correct both in matter and style, but when it denies this power, it uses the language of emphasis, of impression, of intensity. It means the certainty of wrong preference by declaring the inability of right, and, in its vivid use of cannot for will not, is accurate in substance but not in form. Page 549. It is to be remembered that it is not the language of excited, fanatical, fallible men that our author undertakes thus to eviscerate, but the formal didactic assertions of the inspired writers. We can hardly think that he can himself be blind to the nature of the process which he here indicates. The Bible plainly, not in impassioned language but in the most direct terms, asserts the inability of men to certain acts necessary to their salvation. It explains the nature and teaches the origin of that inability. This doctrine, however, is in conflict not with other assertions of Scripture, for there are no counter-statements, but with a peculiar theory of responsibility which the author adopts, and therefore all the expressions of this truth are to be set down to irrational feeling which does not understand itself. Thus a doctrine which is found in the symbols of all churches, Latin, Lutheran, and Reformed, is explained out of the Bible, and the most vapid formula of Pelagianism, viz. that present strength to moral and spiritual duties is the measure of obligation, put in its place. The author has surely forgot what a few pages before he said of the informing nature of Christian consciousness. If there is one thing which that consciousness teaches all Christians more clearly than anything else, it is their helplessness, their inability to do what reason, conscience, and God require, in the plain, unsophisticated sense of the word inability. And we venture to say that no Christian ever used from the heart such language as Professor Park puts into the good man's mouth about his power to do all that God requires. Such is not the language of the heart, but of a head made light by too much theorizing. Give us by all means the theology of the heart in preference to the theology of the intellect. We would a thousandfold rather take our faith from Professor Park's feelings than from what he miscalls his reason, but which is in fact the fragments of a philosophy that was, but is not. His fourth remark is that the theology of the intellect and that of the feeling tend to keep each other within the sphere for which they were respectively designed, and in which they are fitted to improve the character. When an intellectual statement is transferred to the province of emotion, it often appears chilling, lifeless, and when a passionate phrase is transferred to the dogmatic province, it often appears grotesque, unintelligible, absurd. To illustrate this point, he refers to the declaration in reference to the bread and wine in the Eucharist. This is my body, this is my blood. To excited feelings, such language is appropriate, but no sooner are these phrases transmuted into utterances of intellectual judgments than they become absurd. So the lamentation, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, is natural and proper as an expression of penitential feelings, but if seized by a theorist to straighten out into the dogma that man is blamable before he chooses to do wrong, deserving of punishment for the involuntary nature which he has never consented to gratify, really sinful before we actually sin, then all is confusion. Here again, a plain doctrine of the Bible, incorporated in all Christian creeds, inwrought into all Christian experience, is rejected in deference to the theory that all sin consists in acts, a theory which ninety-nine hundredths of all good men utterly repudiate, a theory which never has had a standing in the symbols of any Christian church, a clear proof that it is in conflict with the common consciousness of believers. Because the doctrine here discarded finds expression in a penitential psalm, is surely no proof that it is not a doctrine of Scripture. Thomas's passionate exclamation at the feet of his risen Saviour, My Lord and my God, is no proof that the divinity of Christ belongs to the theology of feeling, and is to be rejected by the reason. It is because such doctrines are didactically taught in the Bible and presented as articles of faith that they work themselves into the heart and find expression in its most passionate language. The doctrine of innate sinful depravity does not rest on certain poetic phrases. It is assumed and accounted for it. It is implicated in the doctrines of redemption, regeneration, and baptism. 
It is sustained by arguments from analogy, experience, and consciousness. It is part and parcel of the universal faith of Christendom, and its rejection, on the score that passionate phrases are not to be interpreted by the letter, is as glaring an example of subjecting scripture to theory as the history of interpretation affords. In the conclusion of his discourse, our author represents the confusion of the two kinds of theology, which he endeavours to discriminate as a great source of evil. Grave errors, he says, have arisen from so simple a cause as that of confounding poetry with prose. Is it not a still more dangerous mistake to turn prose into poetry? What doctrine of the scriptures have rationalists, by that simple process, failed to explain away? What do they make of the ascription of divine names and attributes to Christ, but Eastern metaphor and hyperbole? How do they explain the worship paid to him on earth and in heaven, but as the language of passion, which the intellect repudiates? The fact is that poetry and prose have their fixed rules of interpretation, and there is no danger of mistaking the one for the other, nor are they ever so mistaken where there is a disposition humbly to receive the truth they teach. In the Bible, says our author, quote, there are pleasing hints of many things, which were never designed to be doctrines, such as the literal and proper necessity of the will, passive and physical sin, baptismal regeneration, clerical absolution, the literal imputation of guilt to the innocent, transubstantiation, eternal generation and procession. In that graceful volume these metaphors bloom as the flowers of the field. There they toil not, neither do they spin. But the schoolman has transplanted them to the rude exposure of logic, there they are frozen up, their juices evaporated, and their withered leaves are preserved as specimens of that which, in its rightful place, surpassed the glory of the wisest sage. End quote, page 558. It would be a pity to throw the veil of comment over the self-evidencing light of such a sentence. Its animus is self-revealing. A more cheering inference from the doctrine of his sermon our author finds in the revelation it affords of the identity and the essence of many systems which are run in scientific or aesthetic moulds unlike each other. There are, indeed, kinds of theology which cannot be reconciled with each other. There is a life, a soul, a vitalizing spirit of truth, which must never be relinquished for the sake of peace, even with an angel. There is, as we rejoice to hear our author say, quote, a line of separation which cannot be crossed between those systems which insert and those which omit the doctrine of justification by faith in the sacrifice of Jesus. This is the doctrine which blends in itself the theology of intellect and feeling, and which can no more be struck out from the moral than the sun from the planetary system. Here, the mind and the heart, like justice and mercy, meet and embrace each other, and here is found the specific and ineffaceable difference between the gospel and every other system. But among those who admit the atoning death of Christ as the organic principle of their faith, there are differences, some of them more important, but many far less important than they seem to be. One man prefers a theology of the judgment, a second, that of the imagination, a third, that of the heart. One adjusts his faith to a lymphatic, another to a sanguine, and still another to a choleric temperament. Yet the subject matter of these heterogeneous configurations may often be one and the same, having for its nucleus the same cross, with the formative influence of which all is safe. End quote. Page 559. But what, in the midst of all these diversities, becomes of God's word? Is that so multiform and heterogeneous in its teaching? Or is the rule of faith, after all subjective, a man's temperament and preferences? It is obvious first that the scriptures teach one definite form of faith to which it is the duty, and for the spiritual interests of every man, to conform his faith, and every departure from which is evil and tends to evil. Secondly, that there is doubtless far more agreement in the apprehension and inward experience of the doctrines of the Bible than in the outward expression of them, so that since Christians agree much more nearly in their faith than they do in their professions. Thirdly, that this is no proof that diversities of doctrinal propositions are matters of small moment, or that we may make light of all differences which do not affect the very fundamentals of the gospel. Truth and holiness are most intimately related. The one produces and promotes the other. What injures the one injures also the other. Paul warns all teachers against building, even on the true foundation, with wood, hay, and stubble. He reminds them that God's temple is sacred, that it cannot be injured with impunity, 
and that those who inculcate error instead of truth will in the great day suffer loss, though they may themselves be saved as by fire. It will avail them little to say that their temperament was lymphatic, sanguine, or choleric, that they conceived of truth themselves and presented it to others in a manner suited to their idiosyncrasies. They were sent to teach God's word and not their own fancies. The temple of God, which temple is the church, is not to be built up by rubbish. When we began to write, we intended to furnish an analysis of this discourse before making any remarks on the views which it presents. We have been seduced, however, into giving expression to most of what we had to say in the form of comment on the successive heads of the sermon. We shall therefore not trespass much longer on the reader's patience. There are two points to which it has been our object to direct attention. First, the theory here propounded, and secondly, the application which the author makes of his principle. As to the theory itself, it seems to us to be founded on a wrong psychology. Whatever doctrine the writer may actually hold as to the nature of the soul, his thoughts and language are evidently framed on the assumption of a much greater distinction between the cognitive and emotional faculties in man than actually exists. The very idea of a theology of feeling, as distinct from that of the intellect, seems to take for granted that there are two percipient principles in the soul. The one sees a proposition to be true, the other sees it to be false. The one adopts symbols to express its apprehensions, the other is precise and prosaic in its language. We know indeed that the author would repudiate this statement and deny that he held to any such dualism in the soul. We do not charge him with any theoretic conviction of this sort. We only say that this undue dissevering the human faculties underlies his whole doctrine, and is implied in the theory which he has advanced. Both scripture and consciousness teach that the soul is a unit, that its activity is one life. The one rational soul apprehends, feels, and determines. It is not one faculty that apprehends, another that feels, and another that determines. Nor can you separate in the complex states of mind of which we are every moment conscious the feeling from the cognition. From the very nature of affection in a rational being, the intellectual apprehension of its object is essential to its existence. You cannot eliminate the intellectual element and leave the feeling. The latter is but an attribute of the former, as much as form or colour is an attribute of bodies. It is impossible, therefore, that what is true to the feelings should be false to the intellect. It is impossible that a man should have the feeling, i.e. the consciousness, of inability to change his own heart, and yet the conviction that he has the requisite power. The mind cannot exist in contradictory states at the same time. Men may indeed pass from one state to another. They may sometimes speak under the influence of actual experience, and sometimes under the guidance of a speculative theory, and such utterances may be in direct conflict. But then the contradiction is real and not merely apparent. The intellectual conviction expressed in the one state is the direct reverse of that expressed in the other. These are the vacillations of fallible men whose unstable judgments are determined by the varying conditions of their minds. We have known men educated under the influence of a sceptical philosophy who have become sincere Christians. Their conversion was, of course, a supernatural process involving a change of faith as well as feeling. But as this change was not effected by a scientific refutation of their former opinions, but by the demonstration of the Spirit revealing to them the truth and power of the gospel, when the hearts of such men grow cold, their former sceptical views rise before them in all their logical consistence and demand assent to their truth, which for the time is reluctantly yielded, though under a solemn protest of the conscience. When the Spirit returns, revealing Christ, these demons of doubt vanish and leave the soul rejoicing in the faith. These states cannot coexist. The one is not a state of feeling, the other of cognition. Both are not true, the one when judged by one standard and the other by another. They are opposite and contradictory. The one affirms what the other denies. One must be false." A poor, fallible man, driven about by the waves, may thus give utterance to different theologies under different states of mind, but the difference, as just stated, is that between truth and falsehood. Nothing of this kind can be admitted with regard to these sacred penmen, and therefore this change to which uninspired men may be subject in their apprehension and expression of religious truth cannot be attributed to those who spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
The changes just referred to are therefore something very different from those for which our author contends, and consequently the occurrence of such changes in the experience of men is no proof of the correctness of his theory. Neither do they show that the mind is not one percipient, feeling, and willing agent. The point which we wish now to urge is that the theory of Professor Park assumes a greater difference in the faculties of the soul than actually exists. From its individuality and unity it follows that all its affections suppose a cognition of their appropriate objects, and that such cognition is an intellectual exercise and must be conformed to the laws of the intelligence, and consequently in those complex states of mind to which our author refers as illustrating the origin of the theology of feeling, the rational element is that very cognition by the intellect which belongs to the other form of theology. Besides, it is to be remembered that although in the apprehension of speculative truths, as in mathematics, for example, the cognition is purely an intellectual exercise, but when the object is an aesthetic or moral truth, the apprehension is of necessity complex. There is no such thing as a purely intellectual cognition of a moral truth. It is the exercise of a moral nature. It implies moral sensibility. It, of necessity, involves feeling to a greater or less degree. It is the cognition of a being sensitive to moral distinctions, and without that sensibility there can be no such cognition. To separate these two elements, therefore, is impossible, and to place them in collision is a contradiction. A man can no more think an object to be cold, which he feels to be warm, or to be beautiful, which he sees to be deformed, than he can apprehend it as false and feel it to be true. It contradicts the laws of our nature as well as all experience, to say that the feelings apprehend Christ as suffering the penalty of the law in our stead, while the intellect pronounces such apprehension to be false. You might as well say that we feel a thing to be good while we see it to be sinful, or feel it to be pleasant while we know it to be the reverse. Professor Park's whole theory is founded upon the assumption that such contradictions actually exist. It supposes not different modes of activity but different percipient agencies in the soul, it assumes not that the soul can perceive one way at one time, and another way at another time, which all admit, but that the feelings perceive in one way and the intellect in another, the one seeing a thing as true while the other sees it to be false. It is important to note the distinction between the different judgments which we form of the same object in different states of mind, and the theory of this discourse. The distinction is twofold. The diverse successive judgments of which we are conscious are different intellectual cognitions and not different modes of apprehending the same object by different faculties, the feelings and the intellect. For example, if a man judges at one time Christianity to be true and at another that it is false, it would be absurd to say that it is true to his feelings and false to his intellect. The fact is, at one time he sees the evidence of the truth of the gospel and assents to it. At others, his mind is so occupied by objections that he cannot believe. This is a very common occurrence. A man in health and fond of philosophic speculations may get his mind in a state of complete scepticism. When death approaches, or when he is convinced of sin, he is a firm believer. Or, at one time, the doctrines of man's dependence of God's sovereignty and the like are seen and felt to be true. At another, they are seen and felt to be false. That is, the mind rejects them with conviction and emotion. In all such cases of different judgments, we have different intellectual apprehensions as well as different feelings. It is not that a proposition is true to the intellect and false to the feelings, or the reverse, but at one time it is true to the intellect and at another false to the same faculty. This, which is a familiar fact of consciousness, is, we apprehend, very different from Professor Park's doctrine. The second distinction is this. According to our author, these conflicting apprehensions are equally true. It is true to the feelings that Christ satisfied divine justice, that we have a sinful nature, that we are unable of ourselves to repent and believe the gospel, but all these propositions are false to the intellect. He therefore can reconcile it with his views that good men, and even the inspired writers, should sometimes affirm and sometimes deny these and similar propositions. We maintain that such propositions are irreconcilable. The one judgment is true and the other false. Both can never be uttered under the guidance of the Spirit. He cannot lead the sinner to feel helplessness and inspire Paul to deny it. Footnote. This is so plain a matter that Professor Park has himself given utterance to the same truth. Is God, he asks, the author of confusion? 
in his word revealing one doctrine and by his spirit persuading his people to reject it? Page 544. Surely not, and therefore, if the sanctified heart, i.e. the feelings under the influence of the spirit, or to use our author's phraseology, if the theology of feeling pronounces a doctrine to be true, nothing but a sceptical intellect can pronounce it to be false. End footnote. Much less can he inspire men sometimes to assert and sometimes to deny the same thing. When the mind passes, as we all know it repeatedly does, from the disbelief to the belief of those and other doctrines, it is a real change in its cognitions as well as in its feelings, a change which implies fallibility and error, and which therefore can have no place in the Bible, and can furnish no rule of interpreting its language or the language of Christian experience. To make the distinction between Professor Park's theory and the common doctrine on this subject, the more apparent, we call attention to their different results. He teaches that the theology of feelings, which apprehends and expresses truth in forms which the intellect cannot sanction, is appropriate to the hymn book and the liturgy. He assumes that forms of devotion which are designed to express religious feeling may properly contain much that the intelligence rejects as false. He condemns those critics who are ready to exclude from our psalms and hymns all such stanzas as are not accurate expressions of dogmatic truth. In opposition to this view, we maintain that the feelings demand truth, i.e. truth which satisfies the intellect, in the appropriation and expression of their object. The form in which that truth is expressed may be figurative, but it must have the sanction of the understanding. The least suspicion of falsehood destroys the feeling. The soul cannot feel towards Christ as God if it regards him as merely a man. It cannot feel towards him as a sacrifice if it believes he died simply as a martyr. In short, it cannot believe what it knows to be a lie, or apprehend an object as false and yet feel towards it as true. Let it be assumed that a man is convinced that ability is necessary to responsibility, that sin cannot be imputed to the innocent, that Christ did not satisfy divine justice, then no genuine religious feeling can find expression in such forms of speech. Professor Park says on this principle, he must believe that God actually came from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran, that he really rode upon a chariot, etc. This indicates a most extraordinary confusion of mind. Is there no difference between the figurative expression of what is true and the assertion of what is false? The phrase that God came from Timon, or he made the clouds his chariot, when interpreted according to the established laws of language, expresses a truth. The phrases Christ took upon him our guilt, he satisfied divine justice, etc., etc., when interpreted by the same laws, express, as our author thinks, what is false. Is there then no difference between these cases? Professor Park evidently confounds two things which are as distinct as day and night, viz. a metaphor and a falsehood, a figurative expression and a doctrinal untruth. Because the one is allowable, he pleads for the other also. Because I may express the truth that Christ was a sacrifice by calling him the Lamb of God who bears the sin of the world, I may, in solemn acts of worship, so address him without believing in his sacrificial death at all. All religious language, false to the intellect, is profane to the feelings and a mockery of God. That such is the dictate of Christian consciousness is plain from the fact that the hymn book or liturgy of no church contains doctrines contrary to the creed of such church. We challenge Professor Park to produce from the hymns used by Presbyterians a single phrase inconsistent with the Westminster Confession. If one such could be found, its inaccuracy as an expression of dogmatic truth would be universally regarded as a sufficient reason for its repudiation. Men may no more sing falsehood to God than speak it in the pulpit, or profess it in a creed. In the early part of his discourse, our author says the intellect does not originate the phrase, God the mighty maker died. This he attributes to the feelings as a passionate expression designed to be impressive rather than intelligible. This, therefore, we presume he would adduce as an example of doctrinal inaccuracy in the language of devotion. A moment's reflection, however, is sufficient to show that instead of this phrase being forced on the intellect by the feelings, it has to be defended by the intellect at the bar of the feelings. The latter at first recoil from it. It is not until its strict doctrinal propriety is apprehended by the intelligence that the feelings acquiesce in its use and open themselves to the impression of the awful truth which it contains. An attempt was actually made on the score of taste to exclude that phrase from our hymn-book, 
part, its restoration was demanded by the public sentiment of the Church on the score of doctrinal fidelity. It was seen to be of importance to assert the truth that he, the person who died upon the cross, was God, the mighty maker, the Lord of glory, the Prince of life. For on this truth depends the whole value of his death. In all cases, therefore, we maintain that the religious feelings demand truth and repudiate falsehood. They cannot express themselves under forms which the intelligence rejects, for those feelings themselves are the intelligence in a certain state, and not some distinct percipient agent. Here, as before remarked, is the radical error of our author's theory. It supposes, in fact, two conflicting intelligences in man, the one seeing a thing to be true, and the other seeing it to be false, and yet both seeing correctly from its own position and for its own object. We have endeavoured to show that there is no such dualism in the soul and therefore no foundation for two such systems of conflicting theologies as this theory supposes. The familiar fact that men sometimes regard a doctrine as true and sometimes look upon it as false, that they have conflicting judgments and give utterances to inconsistent declarations, we maintain is no proof of a theology of the feelings as distinct from that of the intellect. These vacillating judgments are really contradictory apprehensions of the intellect, one of which must be false, and therefore to attribute them to the sacred writers under the plea that they sometimes spoke to be impressive and sometimes to be intelligible is to destroy their authority, and to use in worship expressions which the intellect pronounces doctrinally untrue is repudiated by the whole Christian church as profane. If we wish to get the real faith of a people, that faith on which they live, in which intellect and heart, like acquiesce, go to their hymns and forms of devotion, there they are sincere, there they speak what they know to be true, and there consequently their true creed is to be found. Having endeavoured to show that Professor Park finds no foundation for his theory in the constitution of our nature, or in those familiar changes of views and feelings, in varying states of mind, of which all are conscious, we wish to say further that this theory finds no support in the different modes in which the mind looks on truth for different purposes. Sometimes a given proposition, or the truth which it contains, is contemplated merely in its relation to the reason. Its import, its verity, its consistency with the standard of judgment is all that the mind regards. Sometimes it contemplates the logical relations of that with other truths, and sometimes it is the moral excellence of truth which is the object of attention. When the mind addresses itself to the contemplation of truth, its posture and its subjective state will vary according to the object it has in view. But neither the truth itself nor the apprehension of it as truth suffers any change. It is not seen now as true and now as false, or true to the feelings and false to the reason, but one and the same truth is viewed for different purposes. When, for example, we open the Bible and turn to any particular passage, we may examine it to ascertain its meaning, or, having determined its import, we may contemplate the truth it contains in its moral aspects and in its relation to ourselves. These are different mental operations, and the state of mind which they suppose or induce must, of course, be different. Every Christian is familiar with this fact. He knows what it is to contemplate the divine perfections for the purpose of understanding them, and to meditate on them to appreciate their excellence and feel their power. He sometimes is called on to form a clear idea of what the Bible teaches of the constitution of Christ's person or the nature of his work. But much more frequently his mind turns towards the Son of God, clothed in our nature, to behold his glory, to rejoice in his divine excellence and amazing condescension and love. In all such cases the intellectual apprehension is the same. It is the very truth and the very same form of that truth which is arrived at by a careful exegesis which is the subject of devout meditation. A Christian does not understand the Bible in one way when he reads it as a critic and in another way when he reads it for spiritual edification. His thoughts of God and Christ when endeavouring to discover the truth revealed concerning them are the same as when he is engaged in acts of worship. Nay more, the clearer and more extended this speculative knowledge, the brighter and more undisturbed is the spiritual vision, other things being equal. 
One man may indeed be a better theologian but a less devout Christian than another, but the devout Christian is only the more devout, with every increase in the clearness and consistency of his intellectual apprehensions. It may be further admitted that the language of speculation is different from the language of emotion, that the terms employed in defining a theological truth are not always those which would be naturally employed in setting forth that truth as the object of the affections. But these representations are always consistent. All hymns to Christ express precisely the same doctrine concerning his person that is found in the Athanasian Creed. The same remarks may be made in reference to all departments of theology. The doctrines concerning the condition of men by nature of their relation to Adam, of their redemption through Christ, of the work of God's Spirit, may be examined either to be understood or to be felt. But in every case it is the truth as understood that is felt. The understanding does not take one view and the feelings are different. The former does not pronounce for plenary power and the latter for helplessness. The one does not assert that all sin consists in acts and the other affirm the sinfulness of the heart. The one does not look on Christ as merely teaching by his death that sin is an evil, and the other behold him as bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. This subject admits of abundant illustration, did our limits allow of a protracted discussion. A man may look over a tract of country, and his inward state will vary with his object. He may contemplate it in reference to its agricultural advantages, or in regard to its topography, or its geological formation or he may view it as a landscape. Another may gaze on a picture, or on any other work of art, as a critic, to ascertain the sources of the effect produced, or simply to enjoy it as an object of beauty. He may listen to a strain of music, to note the varying intervals, the succession of chords and the like, or merely to receive the pleasurable impression of the sounds. In all these cases the object contemplated is the same, the intellectual apprehension is the same, and though the state of mind varies as the design of the observer varies, and though the terms which he employs as an agriculturalist or a geologist or a critic may differ from those which he uses to give expression to his emotions, there can be no contrariety. He cannot apprehend the same region to be barren and yet fertile, the same picture to be beautiful and yet the reverse, the same strain to be melodious and yet discordant. His intellect cannot make one report, and his feelings an opposite one. It is thus with regard to divine truth. It may be viewed in order to be understood, or in order to be felt. We may come to the contemplation of it as theologians or as Christians, and our inward state will vary with our object, but there will be no contrariety in our apprehensions or in their expression. The points of difference between the views expressed in the foregoing paragraph and the theory of this discourse are two. First, Professor Park makes the perceptions themselves to vary, so that what appears true to the feelings is apprehended as false by the intellect. Secondly, he says that the expression of these different perceptions is, or may be, contradictory. Hence there may be, and actually are, two theologies, the one affirming, the other denying, the one teaching sound, old-school orthodoxy, the other any form of new-school divinity that suits the reigning fashion in philosophy. We maintain, on the contrary, that there is perfect consistency between the intellectual apprehension of truth when viewed in order to be understood and when contemplated in order to be felt, and that, however different the language employed on these different occasions, there can be no contradiction. There cannot, therefore, be two conflicting theologies, but, on the contrary, the theology of the feeling is the theology of the intellect in all its accuracy of thought and expression. There is still another view of this subject, so extensive and important, that we hesitate even to allude to it in the conclusion of this article. What is the true relation between feeling and knowledge in matters of religion? The discussion of this question might properly be made to cover the whole ground embraced in this discourse, this is really the point which Professor Park's subject called upon him to elucidate, but which he has only incidentally referred to. We have already endeavoured to show that this relation is not such as his theory assumes. It does not admit of contradiction between the two. There cannot be two conflicting theologies, one of the feeling and another of the intellect. But if these principles cannot be in conflict, what is the relation between them? Are they independent, as rationalism supposes, 
which allows a feeling no place in determining our faith? Or is the intellect determined by the feelings, so that the province of the former is only to act as the interpreter of the latter? Or are the feelings determined by the intellect, so that the intellectual apprehension decides the nature of the affection? These are questions upon which we cannot now enter. It appears very evident to us that neither the first nor the second of the views here intimated has any support either from scripture or experience. The intellect and feelings are not independent, nor is the former the mere interpreter of the latter. This is becoming a very current opinion, and has been adopted in all its length from Schleiermacher by Morell. Knowledge or truth, objectively revealed, is, according to this theory, of very subordinate importance. We have certain religious feelings. To develop the contents of those feelings is the province of the intelligence, so that theology is but the intellectual forms in which the religious consciousness expresses itself. The standard of truth is therefore nothing objective but this inward feeling. Any doctrine which can be shown to be the legitimate expression of an innate religious feeling is true, and any which is assumed to have a different origin or to be foreign to the religious consciousness is to be rejected. What the scriptures teach on this subject is, as it seems to us in few words simply this, in the first place, agreeably to what has already been said, the Bible never recognizes that broad distinction between the intellect and the feelings which is so often made by metaphysicians. It regards the soul as a perceiving and feeling individual subsistence, whose cognitions and affections are not exercises of distinct faculties, but complex states of one and the same subject. It never predicates depravity or holiness of the feelings as distinct from the intelligence, or of the latter as distinct from the former. The moral state of the soul is always represented as affecting its cognitions as well as its affections. In popular language, the understanding is darkened as well as the heart depraved. In the second place, the scriptures as clearly teach that holiness is necessary to the perception of holiness. In other words, that the things of the spirit must be spiritually discerned, that the unrenewed have not this discernment, and therefore they cannot know the things which are freely given to us of God, i.e. the things which he has graciously revealed in this word. They may have that apprehension of them which an uncultivated ear has of complicated musical sounds, or an untutored eye of a work of art. Much of the object is perceived, but much is not discerned, and that which remains unseen is precisely that which gives to these objects their peculiar excellence and power. Thirdly, the Bible further teaches that no mere change of the feelings is adequate to secure this spiritual discernment, but, on the contrary, in the order of nature and of experience, the discernment precedes the change of the affections, just as the perception of beauty precedes the answering aesthetic emotion. The eyes must be opened in order to see wondrous things out of the law of God. The glory of God as it shines in the face of Jesus Christ must be revealed before the corresponding affections of admiration, love and confidence rise in the heart. This illumination is represented as the peculiar work of the Spirit. The knowledge consequent on this illumination is declared to be eternal life. It is the highest form of the activity of the soul. It is the vision of God and of the things of God, now seen indeed as through a glass darkly. This knowledge is the intuition not merely of the truth but also of the excellence of spiritual objects. It is common to all the people of God, given to each in his measure, but producing in all a conviction and love of the same great truths. If this be a correct exhibition of scriptural teaching on this subject, it follows first that the feelings are not independent of the intellect or the intellect of the feelings, so that the one may be unholy and the other indifferent, or so that the one is uninfluenced by the other. It must also follow that the feelings do not determine the intelligence, as though the latter, in matters of religion, was the mere exponent of the former. The truth is not given in the feelings and discovered and unfolded by the intellect. The truth is objectively presented in the word, and is by the spirit revealed in its excellence to the intelligence, and thus the feelings are produced as necessary attributes or adjuncts of spiritual cognition. This is not the light system. We do not hold that the heart is changed by the mere objective presentation of the truth. 
the intellect and heart are not two distinct faculties to be separately affected or separately renewed. There is a divine operation of which the whole soul is the subject. The consequence of the change thus effected is the intuition of the truth and glory of the things of God. If this representation be correct, there must be the most perfect harmony between the feelings and the intellect. They cannot see with different eyes or utter discordant language. What is true to the one must be true to the other. What is good in the estimation of the one must be good also to the other. Language which satisfies the reason in the expression of truth must convey the precise idea which is embraced in the glowing cognition which constitutes religious feeling, and all the utterances of emotion must justify themselves at the bar of the intellect as expressing truth before they can be sanctioned as vehicles of the religious affections. The relation then between feeling and knowledge as assumed in scripture and proved by experience, is utterly inconsistent with the theory of this discourse, which represents them in perpetual conflict, the one affirming our nature to be sinful, the other denying it, the one teaching the doctrine of inability, the other that of plenary power, the one craving a real vicarious punishment of sin, the other teaching that a symbolical atonement is all that is needed, the one pouring forth its fervent misconceptions in acts of devotion, and the other whispering, all that must be taken cum grano salis. We have now endeavoured to show that there is no foundation for Professor Park's theory in the use of figurative language as the expression of emotion, nor in those conflicting judgments which the mind forms of truth in its different conditions, nor in the different states of mind consequent on contemplation of truth for different objects, nor in what the scriptures and experience teach concerning the relation between the feelings and intellect. We have further endeavoured to show that this theory is destructive of the authority of the Bible, because it attributes to these sacred writers conflicting and irreconcilable representations. Even should we admit that the feelings and the intellect have different apprehensions and adopt different modes of expression, yet as the feelings of the sacred writers were excited, as well as their cognitions determined by the Holy Spirit, the two must be in perfect harmony. In unrenewed or imperfectly sanctified, uninspired men, there might be, on the hypothesis assumed, this conflict between feeling and knowledge, but to attribute such contradictions to the Scriptures is to deny their inspiration. Besides this, the practical operation of a theory which supposes that so large a part of the Bible is to be set aside as inexact because the language of passion must be to subject its teachings to the opinion and prejudices of the reader. No adequate criteria are given for discriminating between the language of feeling and that of the intellect. Everyone is left to his own discretion in making the distinction, and the use of this discretion, regulated by no fixed rules of language, is of course determined by caprice or taste. But even if our objections to the theory of this discourse be deemed unsound, the arbitrary application which the author makes of his principles would be enough to condemn them. We have seen that he attributes to the feeling the most abstract propositions of scientific theology, that he does not discriminate between mere figurative language and the language of emotion, that he adopts or rejects the representations of the Bible at pleasure, or as they happen to coincide with or contradict his preconceived opinions that a sentence of condemnation passed on all men for the sin of one man, that men are by nature the children of wrath, that without Christ we can do nothing, that he hath redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us, that men are not merely pardoned but justified, are represented as bold metaphors, impressive but not intelligible, true to the feelings but false to the reason. It will be a matter of deep regret to many to find Professor Park, with his captivating talents and commanding influence, arrayed against the doctrines repudiated in this discourse, and many more will lament that he should have prepared a weapon which may be used against one doctrine as easily as against another. Our consolation is that, however keen may be the edge or bright the polish of that weapon, it has so little substance it must be shivered into atoms with the first blow it strikes against those sturdy trees which have stood for ages in the garden of the Lord, and whose leaves have been for the healing of the nations. End of section 29
Section 30 of Essays and Reviews by Charles Hodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Theology of the Intellect and That of the Feelings, Article 2, Part 1. Footnote. Remarks on the Princeton Review, Volume 22, Number 4, Article 7, by Edwards A. Park, Abbot Professor in Andover Theological Seminary. Bibliotheca Sacra, January, 1851, Article 9. Princeton Review, April, 1851. End footnote. We are really sorry to find that Professor Park has been so much pained by our review of his convention sermon. His reply evinces a great deal of wounded feeling. The transparent veil which he has thrown over his acerbities only renders them more noticeable. A homely face may pass in a crowd without attracting much attention, but if its unfortunate owner attempt to conceal it by a gauze mask, every eye will be turned upon him. He had better put the mask in his pocket and let his face pass for what it is. Some allowance must be made for our author. When a man delivers a discourse with great éclat, it must, we presume, be very painful to find that the reading public does not confirm the verdict of the admiring audience. This is a very common occurrence. Instead, however, of being satisfied with the obvious solution of this familiar fact, the author, if a politician, is very apt to attribute such unfavourable judgment to party spirit, and if a preacher to theological bigotry. We are the more disposed to be charitable in the present case, because, in our small way, we have had a somewhat similar experience. We wrote a review which we intended to make a model of candour and courtesy. To avoid the danger of misrepresentation, we determined, instead of giving disconnected extracts of the discourse reviewed, to present a full analysis of it, as far as possible, in the author's own words, and to guard against discourtesy, we resolved to abstain from all personal remarks, and to confine ourselves to the theory under discussion. We flattered ourselves that we had been tolerably successful as to both these points. Partial friends confirm us in our self-complacency. Even opponents, though dissenting from our opinion of the sermon, acknowledged the courtesy of the review. Judge then of our chagrin to learn that it is a tissue of misrepresentations filled with arguments ad captandum vulgus and ad invidiam, unblushing in its misstatements. Footnote. Professor Park says repeatedly his reviewer does not blush to say this, does not blush to say this, and does not blush to say that. End footnote. Violating not only the rules of logic, but the canons of fair criticism, and even the laws of morals, the offspring of theological bigotry and sectional jealousy, etc., etc., all this may be accounted for in various ways, except so far as the imputation of unworthy motives is concerned. That we are at a loss to explain. Does not Professor Park know in his heart that it would be a matter of devout thanksgiving to all old-school men to be assured that their doctrines were taught at Andover? Does he suppose there is a man among them capable, from motives conceivable or inconceivable, of wishing that error should be there inculcated? If he can cherish such suspicions, he is of all Christian men the most to be pitied. Having failed so entirely to understand the sermon, we shall not be presumptuous enough to pretend to understand the reply. It is not our purpose, therefore, to review it in detail. We must let it pass and produce its legitimate effect, whatever that may be. We take a deep interest, however, in the main point at issue, which is nothing more or less than this. Is that system of doctrine embodied in the creeds of the Lutheran and Reformed churches, in its substantial and distinctive features, true as to its form as well as to its substance? Are the propositions therein contained true as doctrines, or are they merely intense expressions, true not in the mode in which they are there presented, but only in a vague, loose sense which the intellect would express in a very different form? Are these creeds to be understood as they mean, and do they mean what they say, or is allowance to be made for their freedom, abatement of their force, and their terms to be considered antiquated, and their spirit only as still in force? For example, when these creeds speak of the imputation of Adam's sin, is that to be considered as only an intense form of expressing, quote, the definite idea that we are exposed to evil in consequence of his sin? 
End quote. Footnote. Sermon, page 535. In the following article, the references to Professor Park's sermon are to the edition of it contained in the Bibliotheca Sacra for July 1850, and those to his remarks on the Princeton Review are to the Bibliotheca Sacra for January 1851. That the pointed issue is what is stated in the text will be made more apparent in the sequel, for the present it may be sufficient to refer to the following passages. In giving his reasons for the title of the sermon, Professor Park says, quote, Secondly, the title was selected as a deferential and charitable one. The representations which are classified under the theology of feeling are often sanctioned as the true theology by the men who delight most in employing them. What the sermon would characterize as images, illustrations, and intense expressions, these men call doctrines. We call one system of theology rational or liberal simply because it is so called by its advocates. Much more, then, may we designate by the phrase emotive theology those representations which are so tenaciously defended by multitudes as truth fitted both for the feeling and the judgment. End quote. Remarks, page 140. Quote, a creed, if true to its original end, should be in sober prose, should be understood as it means, and mean what it says, should be drawn out with a discriminating, balancing judgment, so as to need no allowance for its freedom, no abatement of its force, and should not be expressed in antiquated terms, lest men regard its spirit as likewise obsolete. It belongs to the province of the analyzing, comparing, reasoning intellect, and if it leaves this province for the sake of intermingling the phrases of an impassioned heart, it confuses the soul, it awakes the fancy and the feelings to disturb the judgment, it sets a believer at variance with himself by perplexing his reason with metaphors and his imagination with logic. It raises feuds in the church by crossing the temperaments of men and taxing one party to demonstrate similes, another to feel inspired by abstractions. Hence the logomachy, which has always characterized the defense of such creeds. The intellect, no less than the heart, being out of its element, wanders through dry places seeking rest and finding none. Men are thus made uneasy with themselves and therefore acrimonious against each other. The imaginative zealot does not understand the philosophical explanation, and the philosopher does not sympathize with the imaginative style of the symbol and as they misunderstand each other, they feel their weakness, and to be weak is to be miserable, and misery not only loves but also makes company, and thus they sink their controversy into a contention and their dispute into a quarrel. Nor will they ever find peace until they confine their intellect to its rightful sphere, and understand it according to what it says, and their feeling to its province, and interpret its language according to what it means, rendering unto poetry the things that are designed for poetry, and unto prose what belongs to prose. End quote. Sermon, page 554. End footnote. This is surely a question of great importance. From an early period in the history of the Church there have been two great systems of doctrine in perpetual conflict. The one begins with God, the other with man. The one has for its object the vindication of the divine supremacy and sovereignty in the salvation of men. The other has for its characteristic aim the assertion of the rights of human nature. It is specially solicitous that nothing should be held to be true which cannot be philosophically reconciled with the liberty and ability of man. It starts with a theory of free agency and of the nature of sin, to which all the anthropological doctrines of the Bible must be made to conform. Its great principles are, first, that all sin consists in sinning, that there can be no moral character but in moral acts. Secondly, that the power to the contrary is essential to free agency, that a free agent may always act contrary to any influence not destructive of his freedom, which can be brought to bear upon him. Thirdly, that ability limits responsibility, that men are responsible only so far as they have adequate power to do what is required of them, or that they are responsible for nothing not under the control of the will. From these principles it follows that there can be no such thing as original righteousness, that is, a righteousness in which man was originally created. Whatever moral character he had must have been the result of his own acts. Neither can there be any original sin, i.e. an innate, 
hereditary, sinful corruption of nature. Whatever effect Adam's apostasy may have had upon himself or on his posterity, whether it left his nature uninjured and merely changed unfavorably his circumstances, or whether our nature was thereby deteriorated so as to be prone to sin, it was not itself rendered morally corrupt or sinful. Adam was in no such sense the head and representative of his race, that his sin is the ground of our condemnation. Every man, according to this system, stands his probation for himself, and is not under condemnation until he voluntarily transgresses some known law, for it is only such transgression that falls under the category of sin. In regeneration, according to the principles above stated, there cannot be the production of a new moral nature, principle, or disposition as the source of holy exercises. That change must consist in some act of the soul, something which lies within the sphere of its own power, some act of the will, or some change subject to the will. The influence by which regeneration is affected must be something which can be effectually resisted in the utmost energy of its operation. This being the case, the sovereignty of God and the salvation of men must of necessity be given up. With these views of the nature and liberty of man is connected a corresponding view of the moral government of God. Sin has entered the world because it could not be prevented in a moral system. God counteracts and restrains it by every means in his power consistent with the continuance of that system. The obstacle to its extirpation is the free will of man, and the obstacle to its forgiveness is the license which would thereby be given to transgression. As God governs his rational creatures by motives, the work of Christ is a device to meet both these difficulties. It presents a powerful motive to man to forsake sin, and makes such an exhibition of God's displeasure against sin as answers in place of its punishment as a means of moral impression. The work of Christ was not a satisfaction to law and justice in the proper sense of those terms. Justice in God is simply benevolence guided by wisdom. The acceptance of the sinner is the act of a sovereign dispensing with the demands of the law. The righteousness of Christ is not imputed to believers, but as the sin of Adam was the occasion of certain evils coming on his race, so the righteousness of Christ is the occasion of good to his people. From these theoretical views, others of a practical nature necessarily follow. Conviction of sin must accommodate itself to the theory that there is no sin but in the voluntary transgression of known law. A sense of helplessness must be modified by the conviction of ability to repent and believe, to change our own heart and to keep all God's commands. Faith must regard Christ's work as a governmental display of certain divine attributes, such directions as receive Christ, come to him, trust in him, commit the keeping of the soul to him, naturally give place under this system to the exhortation, submit to God, determine to keep his commands, make choice of him in preference to the world. The view which this system presents of the plan of salvation, of the relation of the soul to Christ, of the nature and office of faith, modifies and determines the whole character of experimental religion. The system antagonistic to the one just described has for its object the vindication of the supremacy of God in the whole work of man's salvation, both because he is in fact supreme, and because man, being in fact utterly ruined and helpless, no method of recovery which does not so regard him is suited to his relation to God, or can be made to satisfy the necessities of his nature. This system does not exalt a theory of morals or of liberty over the scriptures as a rule by which they are to be interpreted. It accommodates its philosophy to the facts revealed in the divine word, as the Bible plainly teaches that man was created holy, that he is now born in sin, that when renewed by the Holy Ghost he receives a new nature, it admits the doctrine of concreated holiness, innate sin, and of infused or inherent grace. It acknowledges Adam as the head and representative of his posterity, in whom we had our probation, in whom we sinned and fell, so that we come into the world under condemnation, being born the children of wrath and deriving from him a nature not merely diseased, weakened, or predisposed to evil, but which is itself, as well as all the motions thereof, truly and properly sin. It admits that by this innate, hereditary, moral depravity, men are altogether indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, so that their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the Spirit of Christ. It recognizes justice as distinguished from benevolence, 
to be an essential attribute of God, an attribute which renders the punishment of sin necessary not merely as a means of moral impression, but for its own sake. It therefore regards the work of Christ as designed to satisfy justice and to fulfill the demands of the law by his perfect obedience to its precepts, and by enduring its penalty in the room and stead of sinners. His righteousness is so imputed to believers that their justification is not merely the act of a sovereign dispensing with law, but the act of a judge declaring the law to be satisfied. Regarding man in his natural state as spiritually dead and helpless, this system denies that regeneration is the sinner's own act, or that it consists of any change within his power to effect, or that he can prepare himself thereto, or cooperate in it. It is a change in the moral state of the soul, the production of a new nature, and is effected by the mighty power of God, the soul being the subject and not the agent of the change thereby produced. It receives a new life, which, when imparted, manifests itself in all appropriate holy acts. This life is sustained by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to whose influence all right exercises are to be referred. Salvation is thus, in its provision, application, and consummation, entirely of grace. Conviction of sin under this system is more than remorse for actual transgressions, it is also a sense of the thorough depravity of the whole nature, penetrating far beneath the acts of the soul, affecting its permanent moral states, which lie beyond the reach of the will, and a sense of helplessness is more than a conviction of the stubbornness of the will, it is a consciousness of an entire want of power to change those inherent moral states in which our depravity principally consists, and a consequent persuasion that we are absolutely dependent on God. Christ is not regarded in this system as simply rendering it consistent in God to bestow blessings upon sinners, so that we can come to the Father of ourselves with a mere obeisance to the Lord Jesus for having opened the door. Christ is declared to be our righteousness and life. We are united to him not merely in feeling, but by covenant and vitality by his Spirit, so that the life which we live is Christ living in us. He is, therefore, our all, our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, and consequently what the sinner is called upon to do in order to be saved is not merely to submit to God as his sovereign or to make choice of God as his portion. That indeed he does, but the specific act by which he is saved is receiving and resting on Christ alone for salvation. Hence, neither benevolence, nor philanthropy, nor any other principle of natural piety is the governing motive of the believer's life, but the love of Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Whether the believer lives, he lives unto the Lord, or whether he dies, he dies unto the Lord, so that living or dying he is the Lord's. Who, for this end, both died and rose again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and of the living. There are three leading characteristics of this system by which it is distinguished from that to which it stands opposed. The latter is characteristically rational. It seeks to explain everything so as to be intelligible to the speculative understanding. The former is confessedly mysterious. The apostle pronounces the judgment of God to be unsearchable and his ways past finding out, as they are specially exhibited in the doctrines of redemption and in the dispensations of God towards our race. The origin of sin, the fall of man, the relation of Adam to his posterity, the transmission of his corrupt nature to all descended from him by ordinary generation, the consistency of man's freedom with God's sovereignty, the process of regeneration, the relation of the believer to Christ and other doctrines of the like kind, do not admit of philosophical explanation. They cannot be dissected and mapped off so as that the points of contact and mode of union with all other known truths can be clearly understood, nor can God's dealings with our race be all explained on the common-sense principles of moral government. The system which Paul taught was not a system of common sense, but of profound and awful mystery. The second distinguishing characteristic of this system is that its whole tendency is to exalt God and to humble man. It does not make the latter feel that he is the great end of all things, or that he has his destiny in his own hands. It asks, Who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsellor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? God's supremacy, the apostle teaches us, is seen in his permitting our race to fall in Adam, and sin thus by one man to pass on all men, 
so that by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. It is seen in the nature of the plan of salvation, which excludes all merit on the part of those who are saved, and takes for granted their entire helplessness. It is still more clearly manifested in God's administration of this economy of mercy, in its gradual revelation, in its being so long confined to one nation, in its being now made known to one people and not to another, in its being applied where it is known to the salvation of some, and to the greater condemnation of others, and in the sovereignty which presides over the selection of the vessels of mercy. It is not the wise, the great, or the noble whom God calls, but the foolish, the base, and those that are not, that they who glory should glory in the Lord. Thirdly, this system represents God as himself the end of all his works, both in creation and in redemption. It is not the universe but God, not the happiness of creatures but the infinitely higher end of the divine glory, which is contemplated in all these revelations and dispensations. For of him, through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. It is an undeniable historical fact that this system underlies the piety of the Church in all ages. It is the great granitic formation whose peaks tower towards heaven, and draw thence the waters of life, and in whose capacious bosom repose those green pastures in which the great shepherd gathers and sustains his flock. It has withstood all changes, and it still stands. Heat and cold, snow and rain, gentle abrasion and violent convulsions, leave it as it was. It cannot be moved. In our own age and country this system of doctrine has had to sustain a renewed conflict. It has been assailed by argument, by ridicule, by contempt. It has been pronounced absurd, obsolete, effete, powerless. It has withstood logic, indignation, wit, and even the hexagon. Still it stands. Footnote. The New York Independent, in a notice of our former review, objected to the tone of confidence with which we wrote on this subject. How can we help it? A man behind the walls of Gibraltar, or of Ehrenbreitstein, cannot, if he would, tremble at the sight of a single knight, however gallant or well-appointed he may be. His confidence is due to his position, not to a consciousness of personal strength. A man at sea with a stout ship under him has a sense of security in no measure founded upon himself. A Christian, surrounded by learned sceptics, may be deeply sensible of his own weakness, and yet serenely confident in the strength of his cause. We then, who are within these old walls which have stood for ages, even from the beginning, who can look around and see the names of all generations of saints inscribed on those walls, and who feel the solid rock of God's word under their feet, must be excused for a feeling of security. We invite our critic to come within this strong tower, and to place his feet upon this same rock, and he will find how strength-inspiring it is, even though his personal humility should be increased by the experiment. We beg of him at least not to confound confidence in a system which has been held for ages with self-confidence. Our independent brethren seem to have lost the idea of the church. Some of them have even written against the article in the creed which affirms faith in that doctrine. They appear to think that every man stands by himself, that nothing is ever settled, that every theological discussion is a controversy between individuals. But there is such a thing as the church, and that church has a faith, and against that faith no one man, and no angel, is any fair match. End footnote. What then is to be done? Professor Park, with rare ingenuity, answers, quote, Let us admit its truth, but maintain that it does not differ from the other system. There are two theologies, one for the feelings, the other for the intellect, or what may be made to mean precisely the same thing, two forms of one and the same theology, the one precise and definite, designed to satisfy the intelligence, the other vague and intense, adapted to the feelings. Both are true, for at bottom they are the same. It is in vain to deny this old theology. It is in the Bible, in the creeds, in the liturgies, in the hymns of the church, and in the hearts of God's people. It will not do to laugh at it any longer, it has too much power. We must treat it with respect, and call it doctrine, when we mean only images, illustrations, and intense expressions. End quote. We are now prepared, we think, for a fair statement of the status questionis. The question is not, 
which of the antagonistic systems of theology above described is true, or whether either is true, nor is the question which of the two Professor Park believes, his own faith has nothing to do with the question. So far as the present discussion is concerned, he may hold neither of these systems in its integrity, or he may hold the one, which we believe to be true, or he may hold the opposite one. The point to be considered is not so much a doctrinal one as a principle of interpretation, a theory of exegesis and its application. The question is whether there is any correct theory of interpretation by which the two systems above referred to can be harmonized. Are they two theologies equally true, the one the theology of the intellect, the other the theology of the feelings? In other words, are they different forms of one and the same theology? We take the greater interest in this question because this is evidently the last arrow in the quiver. Everything else has been tried and failed, and if this fail, there is an end of this series of conflicts. Whatever is to come after must be of a different kind and from a different quarter. We propose then, first, to show that the above statement of the question presents fairly and clearly the real point at issue. Secondly, to consider the success of this attempt to harmonize these conflicting systems of theology. And thirdly, to examine the nature of the theory by which that reconciliation has been attempted. That the above statement of the question presents clearly and correctly the real point at issue, we argue in the first place from the distinct avowals of the author. He expresses the hope that, quote, many various forms of faith will yet be blended into a consistent knowledge like the colours in a single ray. Many pious men, he says, are distressed by the apparent contradictions in our best theological literature, and for their sake another practical lesson developed in the discourse is the importance of exhibiting the mutual consistency between all the expressions of right feeling. The discrepancies so often lamented are not fundamental but superficial, and are easily harmonized by exposing the one self-consistent principle which lies at their basis, end quote. Over and over it is asserted in the discourse that while the intellectual theology is accurate not in its spirit only, but in its letter also, the emotive theology involves the substance of truth, although when literally interpreted it may or may not be false. The purport of one entire head in the sermon is to prove that the one theology is precisely the same with the other in its real meaning, though not always in its form, that the expressions of right feeling, if they do contradict each other, when unmodified, can and must be so explained as to harmonize both with each other and with the decisions of the judgment. The sermon repeats again and again that it is impossible to believe contradictory statements, quote, without qualifying some of them, so as to prevent their subverting each other, end quote. That the reason, quote, being the circumspect power which looks before and after, does not allow that of these conflicting statements each can be true, save in a qualified sense, and that such statements must be qualified by disclosing the fundamental principle in which they all agree for substance of doctrine the principle which will rectify one of the discrepant expressions by explaining it into an essential agreement with the other. End quote. The sermon then was designed to harmonize those apparent contradictions in doctrinal statements by which pious men are distressed. It was intended to teach that the two theologies, the intellectual and emotive, although they may differ in form, agree in substance of doctrine. Accordingly, he says, quote, Pitiable indeed is the logomachy of polemic divines. We have somewhere read that the Berkeleyans, who deny the existence of matter, differed more in terms than in opinion from their opponents, who affirmed the existence of matter, for the former uttered with emphasis, We cannot prove that there is an outward world, and then whispered, We are yet compelled to believe that there is one. Whereas the latter, uttered with emphasis, we are compelled to believe in an outer world, and then whispered, yet we cannot prove that there is one. This is not precisely accurate, still it serves to illustrate the amount of difference which exists between the reviewer and the author of the humble convention sermon. End quote. And further, it is said expressly, quote, one aim of the sermon was to show that all creeds, which are allowable, can be reconciled with each other. End quote precisely so. Thus we understand the matter. We do not overlook the word allowable in this statement. It was doubtless intended to do good service. 
We did not understand the sermon to advocate entire scepticism and to teach that whatever may be affirmed can, with equal propriety, be denied. Nor was it understood to teach that all religions are true, being different forms of expression for the same generic religious sentiment. Nor did we understand our author to advocate that latitudinarianism which embraces and harmonizes all nominally Christian creeds. He says expressly, quote, there is a line of separation which cannot be crossed between those systems which insert and those which omit the doctrine of justification by faith in the sacrifice of Jesus. End quote. The sermon, therefore, was not regarded as a plea for Socinianism as an allowable form of Christianity. But it was understood to teach that quote, all allowable creeds can be reconciled with each other. End quote. The only question is what creeds are regarded as coming within this limitation that the two great antagonistic systems which we have attempted to characterize are considered as belonging to this category is evident because these are the systems which from the beginning to the end of the sermon and still more clearly in the reply are brought into view and compared with each other to this fact we appeal as the second proof that the statement of the question at issue as given above is correct the systems which our author attempts to reconcile are those we have described in the former part of this article. In the first place, the radical principles of one of those systems are distinctly presented in the sermon. Those principles, as before remarked, are that moral character is confined to acts, that liberty supposes power to the contrary, and that ability limits responsibility. These principles are all recognized in the following passages of the sermon, if we are capable of understanding the meaning of the author. After representing the convinced sinner as saying, quote, I long to heap infinite upon infinite, and to crown together all forms of self-reproach, for I am clad in sin as with a garment, I devour it as a sweet morsel, I breathe it, I live it, I am sin, etc. He adds, But when a theorist seizes at such living words as these, and puts them into his vice, and straightens them or crooks them into the dogma, that man is blamable before he chooses to do wrong, deserving of punishment for the involuntary nature which he has never consented to gratify, really sinful before he actually sins, then the language of emotion forced from its right place, and treated as if it were part of a nicely measured syllogism, hampers and confuses his reasonings until it is given to the use for which it was first intended, and from which it never ought to have been diverted. End quote. Quote, it is said, however, that a passive nature, existing antecedently to all free action, is itself strictly, literally sinful. Then we must speak a new language and speak in prose of moral patience as well as of moral agents, of men besinned as well as sinners, for ex vi termini sinners as well as runners must be active. We must have a new conscience which can decide on the moral character of moral conditions, as well as of elective preferences, a new law prescribing the very make of the soul, as well as the way in which the soul, when made, shall act, and a law which we transgress, for sin is a transgression of the law, in being before birth passively misshapen. We must also have a new Bible delineating a judgment scene in which some will be condemned not only on account of deeds which they have done in the body, but also for having been born with an involuntary proclivity to sin, and others will be rewarded not only for their conscientious conscious, love to Christ, but also for a blind nature inducing that love. We must, in fine, have an entirely different class of moral sentiments, and have them disciplined by inspiration in an entirely different manner from the present. For now the feelings of all true men revolt from the assertion that a poor infant dying, if we may suppose it to die, before its first wrong preference, merits for its unavoidable nature that eternal punishment which is threatened, and justly, against even the smallest sin although it may seem paradoxical to affirm that a man may believe a proposition which he knows to be false, it is yet charitable to say that whatever any man may suppose himself to believe, he has in fact an inward conviction that all sin consists in sinning. There is comparatively little dispute on the nature of moral evil when the words relating to it are fully understood. End quote. As to the other points, we have such language as the following. Man's, quote, unvaried wrong choices imply a full unremitted natural power of choosing right 
The emotive theology, therefore, when it affirms this power, is correct both in matter and style, but when it denies this power, it uses the language of intensity. It means the certainty of wrong preference by declaring the inability of right, and in its vivid sense of cannot for will not, is accurate in substance, but not in form. End quote. One of the expressions put in the lips of the emotive theology, and which is pronounced correct both in matter and style, is, quote, if I had been as holy as I had power to be, then I had been perfect. End quote. Another is, I know thee, that thou art not a hard master, extracting of me duties which I have no power to discharge, but thou attemperest thy law to my strength, and at no time imposest upon me a heavier burden than thou at that very time makest me able to bear. In note F at the end of the sermon it is said, quote, The pious necessarian has a good moral purpose in declaring that the present and future obligations of men do and will exceed their power. End quote. This in the connection implies that in the judgment of the writer men's obligations do not exceed their power. Not only are these general principles thus recognized, but the two systems are compared very much in their details, and their harmony is exhibited by disclosing the fundamental principle in which they agree for substance of doctrine. The one system says, the sin of Adam is imputed to his posterity. The other says, the sin of Adam is not imputed to his posterity. The fundamental principle in which they agree is, that the sin of Adam was the occasion of certain evils coming upon his race. The former statement is only an intense form of expressing this definite idea. The one system asserts that the nature of man since the fall is sinful, anterior to actual transgressions. The other says all sin consists in sinning. A passive nature existing antecedently to all free action cannot be sinful. Still, these declarations are consistent. Sinful in the former must be taken to mean prone to sin. Quote, this nature as it certainly occasions sin, may be sometimes called sinful in a peculiar sense for the sake of intensity. End quote. The one system says that men, since the fall, are, while unrenewed, utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, so that their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but entirely from the Spirit of Christ. The other asserts that such language is merely a, quote, vivid use of cannot for will not, accurate in substance, though not in its form, end quote. The one teaches that the commands of God continue to bind those who are unable perfectly to keep them. The other asserts that unable here means unwilling, because God always attempers his law to our strength. The one says that man is passive in regeneration, that he therein receives a new nature, a principle of grace which is the source of all holy exercises. The other repudiates the idea of, quote, a blind nature-inducing love, end quote, having a moral character, but it may be called holy as tending to holiness, just as, quote, for the sake of intensity, end quote, we may call that sinful which tends to sin. In like manner, the different representations concerning the work of Christ, however apparently conflicting, are represented as different only in form. Thus, in regard to our relation to Adam, the consequences of his apostasy, the natural state of man, ability and inability, the nature of regeneration, the atonement of Christ, the justification of sinners before God, the statements of the two systems, are declared to be identical in meaning, however different in form, or a mode of statement is proposed which is made to comprehend both. We can hardly be mistaken, therefore, in saying that the design of the sermon is to show that both of these are allowable and may be reconciled. If anything is clear, either in the sermon or the reply, it is that these systems are represented as different modes of presenting one and the same theology, the one adapted to the feeling, the other to the intellect. If this is not the case, then Professor Park has failed to convey the most remote idea of his meaning to a multitude of minds, more or less accustomed to such discussions, and must be set down as either the most unfortunate or the most unintelligible writer of modern times. End of section 30. Section 31 of Essays and Reviews by Charles Hodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Theology of the Intellect and That of the Feelings, Article 2, Part 2. 
If this is a proper statement of the case, it must be admitted that the author has undertaken a great work. We know no parallel to it but the famous Oxford tract number 90, and even that was a modest effort in comparison. Dr. Newman merely attempted to show that there was a non-natural sense of the 39 articles in which a Romanist might sign them. He did not pretend, if our memory serves us, that the sense which he put upon them was their true historical meaning. But Professor Park proposes to show, if we understand him, that the two systems above referred to are identical, that the one is the philosophic explanation of the other, that they are different modes of stating the same general truths, both modes being allowable, that the one, in short, is the theology of the feelings, and the other the theology of the intellect. When we reflect on what is necessarily, even though unconsciously, assumed in this attempt, when we raise our eyes to the height to which it is necessary the author should ascend before all these things could appear alike to him, we are bewildered. It is surely no small matter for a man to rise up and tell the world that the Augustinians and Pelagians, Thomists and Scotists, Dominicans and Franciscans, Jansenists and Jesuits, Calvinists and Remonstrants, footnote, these terms are used in their historical sense, Augustinianism and Pelagianism are designations of forms of theology distinguished by certain characteristic features. The former does not include every opinion held by Augustine, nor the latter every doctrine taught by Pelagius, so of the other terms. When, therefore, it is said that the sermon proposes to show that these classes substantially agree, the only fair interpretation of such language is that it proposes to show that the characteristic theological systems thus designated may be reconciled. Professor Park has taught us that it is not enough to express our meaning clearly. He has shown that he would consider the above statement refuted, should he adduce, as might easily be done, many points in which he would admit the inconsistency between the opinions of Augustine and Pelagius, the Jansenists and Jesuits, Calvinists and Remonstrants. In our former article we said that the doctrine that present strength to moral and spiritual duties is the measure of obligation is one of the radical principles of Pelagianism. He considers himself as confuting that statement by asking whether Pelagius held this or that other doctrine. We did not say he did. What we did say, however, is nonetheless true and uncontradicted. We hope, therefore, no one will take the trouble to show in how many points the Jesuits differed from the Jansenists in morals and discipline, or even in theology, as a refutation of the statement in the text. End footnote. Have, for centuries, been contending about words, that they perfectly agree, if they had but sense to see it, that all the decisions of synods, all the profound discussions of the greatest men in history relating to these subjects, are miserable logomachies. We can understand how even a babe in Christ, under the teaching of the Spirit, may rightfully and in full consciousness of truth lift his solitary voice against the errors of ages. But we cannot understand how any uninspired man could have the courage to say to the two great parties in the church that they understand neither themselves nor each other, that while they think they differ they actually agree. That this attempt to reconcile all allowable creeds is a failure no one would thank us for proving. Can it be necessary to show that the differences between the two systems brought into view in this sermon are substantial differences of doctrine, and not a mere difference in words? To say that the sin of Adam is imputed to his posterity is to express a different thought, a different doctrine, from what is expressed by saying that his sin was merely the occasion of certain evils coming upon his race. The one of these statements is not merely an intense figurative or poetic expression of the thought conveyed by the latter, the former means that the sin of Adam was the judicial ground of the condemnation of his race, and therefore that the evils inflicted on them on account of that sin are of the nature of punishment. My neighbor's carelessness or sin may be the occasion of suffering to me, but no one ever dreamt of expressing didactically that idea by saying that the carelessness or crime of a reckless man was imputed to his neighbors. There is here a real distinction." These two modes of representing our relation to Adam belong to different doctrinal systems. According to the one, no man is condemned until he has personally transgressed the law. Every man stands a probation for himself, either in the womb, as some may say, or in the first dawn of intelligence and moral feeling. According to the other, the race had their probation in Adam, they sinned in him, and fell with him in his first transgression. 
they are therefore born the children of wrath, they come into existence under condemnation. It is now asserted for the first time, so far as we know, since the world began, that these modes of representation mean the same thing. Again, that the corrupt nature which we derive from our first parents is really sinful, is a different doctrine from that which is expressed by saying, our nature, though prone to sin, is not in itself sinful. These are not different modes of stating the same truth. They are irreconcilable assertions. The difference between them is one which enters deeply into our views of the nature of sin, of inability, of regeneration, and of the work of the Holy Spirit. It modifies our convictions and our whole religious experience. It has, in fact, given rise to two different forms of religion in the Church, clearly traceable in the writings of past ages and still existing. We refer our readers to President Edwards's work on original sin and request them to notice with what logical strictness he demonstrates that the denial of the sinfulness of human nature and the assertion of the plenary power of men to obey the commands of God subverts the whole plan of redemption. Our author says he firmly believes, quote, that in consequence of the first man's sin, all men have at birth a corrupt nature which exposes them to suffering, but not to punishment, even without their actual transgression. End quote. In the 39 Articles of the Church of England, it is said of original sin, or depravity of nature, in uno quoque nascentium iram dei atque damnationem meretur. Are not these statements in direct opposition? Does not the one deny what the other affirms? Can they, by any candid or rational interpretation, be made to be mere different modes of stating the same doctrine? These two systems differ no less essentially as to the doctrine of ability. According to the one, man has, since the fall, power to do all that is required of him. According to the other, though he remains a rational creature and a free moral agent, he is utterly unable either to turn himself unto God or to do anything spiritually good. According to the one doctrine, responsibility and inability are incompatible. According to the other, they are perfectly consistent. Footnote. The maxim that men cannot be bound to do what they are unable to perform relates properly to external acts dependent on the will, and to those which are not adapted to our nature. No man is bound to see without eyes, hear without ears, or work without hands. Nor can a creature be required to create a world, nor an idiot to reason correctly. But the maxim has no more to do with the obligations of moral agents in reference to moral acts than the axioms of geometry have. End footnote. Surely these are not different modes of asserting the same doctrine. The man who asserts the entire helplessness of men does not mean the same thing with the man who asserts that they have full power to do all that God commands. These systems are not reconciled, as to this point, by the distinction between natural and moral ability. Because the point of separation is not the nature, but the fact of the sinner's inability. No one denies that this inability is moral so far as it relates to moral acts, arises from the moral state of the soul, and is removed by a moral change. It is, however, nonetheless real and absolute. The question is, what is the state of the unrenewed man? Has he power of himself to change his own heart? Can he, by any act of the will, or by the exercise of any conceivable power belonging to himself, transform his whole character? The one system says yes, and the other says no. And they mean what they say. The one does not, by the assertion of this power, mean merely that men are rational and moral beings. The other, by its negative answer, does not mean merely that men are unwilling to change their own heart. It means that the change is not within the power of the will. It is a change which no volition nor series of volitions can effect. It is a change which nothing short of the mighty power of God can produce. Such is the plain doctrine of Scripture, and such is the testimony of every man's consciousness. If there is anything of which the sinner has an intimate conviction, it is that the heart, the affections, his inherent moral dispositions are beyond his reach, that he can no more change his nature than he can annihilate it. He knows that those who tell him he has this power are but paltering in a double sense and mocking at his misery. 
that this inability, though thus absolute, is perfectly consistent with continued responsibility, is also a plain fact of consciousness and a clearly revealed doctrine of Scripture. None feel their guilt so much as those who are most sensible of their helplessness. It is therefore absurd to represent the assertion of this entire inability as consistent with the assertion that men have full power to do all that is required of them. These statements differ in their essential meaning, they differ in their associated doctrines, they have a different origin and they produce widely different effects. Again, there is a real difference of doctrine and not a mere difference of terms between the statement that Christ's work opens the way for pardon by the moral impression which it makes and the statement that it was a full and proper satisfaction to the law and justice of God. Here again is a difference which affects the whole scheme of redemption and consequently the whole character of our religion. According to the one representation, the believer is simply pardoned and restored to the favour of God. According to the other, he is justified. When a criminal is pardoned and restored to his civil rights, does anyone say he is justified? The word justification expresses far more than the remission of the penalty of the law and the restoration of the offender to favour. And those who teach that the sinner is justified by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ teach something very different from those who make Christ's work the mere occasion of good to his people, by rendering their pardon and restoration to favour consistent with the interests of God's government. According to the one system, the deliverance of the believer from condemnation is an act of a judge. According to the other, it is an act of the sovereign. In the one case, the law is set aside. In the other case, it is satisfied. To remit a debt without payment, out of compassion for the debtor, for the sake of example, or out of regard to the goodness or request of a third party, is a very different thing from the discharge of the debtor on the ground that full payment has been made in his behalf. No less different is the doctrine that Christ's work renders the remission of sin possible, and the doctrine that he has made a full satisfaction for the sins of his people. As these doctrines are different in their nature, so they differ in their effects. The one gives the sense of justification, of that peace which arises out of the apprehension that our sins have been punished, that justice is satisfied, that the law no longer condemns but acquits and pronounces just. If any man is unable to reconcile this conviction, that justice no longer condemns the believer, with the most humbling sense of ill desert, he must be in a state of mind very different from that which has characterized the great body of God's people. It is this sense of personal ill-desert, combined with the assurance that justice can lay nothing to the charge of God's elect, when clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which produces that union of peace with a sense of unworthiness, of confidence with self-distrust, of self-abasement and self-renunciation with the assurance of God's love, which gleams and burns through all the writings of the apostles, and which found utterance in the devotional language of the saints in all ages. Footnote. In reference to this subject, Professor Park uses the following language in his remarks on our review. In regard to the remark that Christ has fully paid the debt of sinners, he asks, does not the reviewer himself qualify this phrase in his common explanations of it? Why does he so often teach that Christ has not paid the debt of sinners in any such sense, which would be the ordinary sense of the phrase, as to make it unjust in God to demand the sinner's own payment of it? Why does he teach that although the debt of sinners is paid in a very peculiar sense, yet it is not so paid, but that they may be justly cast into prison until they themselves have paid the uttermost farthing? Another illustration is the unqualified remark that Christ suffered the whole punishment which sinners deserve. And does not the reviewer elsewhere thrust in various modifications of this phrase, saying Christ did not suffer any punishment in such a sense, as renders it unjust for the entire punishment of the law to be still inflicted on transgressors? That he did not suffer the whole, the precise eternal punishment which sinners deserve, that in fact he did not suffer any punishment at all in its common acceptation of pain inflicted on a transgressor of law, on account of his transgression, and for the purpose of testifying the lawgiver's hatred of him as a transgressor. Why then does the reviewer here represent this unqualified remark as identical with the ambiguous phrase, Christ bore our punishment, and as a summation of the manifold and diversified representations of Scripture? End quote. Reply, page 162. 
It may serve to convince the author that there is a real difference between the two systems under comparison, to be told that his reviewer does hold that Christ has paid the debt of sinners in such a sense that it would be unjust to exact its payment from those who believe. The reviewer does hold that Christ has suffered the punishment of sin in such a sense that it would be unjust to exact that punishment of those who accept of his righteousness. This is the very idea of justification. Paul's whole argument is founded on this principle. The law cannot justify those whom it condemns, neither can it condemn those whom it justifies. There is no condemnation, no danger of it, no exposure to it, to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth, who is he that condemneth? This view of justification arises from the very nature of substitution and vicarious punishment. The punishment of sin is necessary from the holiness and justice of God. That punishment may, as we learn from Scripture, be endured by one competent to sustain the load in the place of others. Christ, the eternal Son of God, assumed our nature, took our place, fulfilled all righteousness, completely obeying the precept and enduring the penalty of the law as our substitute. Its demands were thus satisfied, i.e., it has nothing to demand as the ground of justification of those interested in the righteousness of Christ. That righteousness being imputed to them is the ground in justice of their being accepted as righteous in the sight of God. In themselves they are hell-deserving. To them their acceptance is a matter of grace because it is not their own righteousness but the righteousness of another that is the ground of their justification. As this is the form in which this doctrine is presented in Scripture, so it has its foundation in our own moral constitution. Men have a constitutional sense of justice, an intimate conviction that sin ought to be punished, and therefore they cannot be satisfied until such punishment is inflicted. No mere pardon, no restoration to favour, no assurance that the evil effects of forgiveness will be prevented, can satisfy this intimate conviction. In all ages, therefore, men have demanded an atonement, and by atonement they have not understood a means of moral impression, but a method of satisfying justice. As these means have been ineffectual, the sacrifices of the heathen only serve to reveal the sentiment to which they owe their origin. But in the vicarious sufferings of the Son of God, in his bearing the punishment of our sins, what was merely symbolized in the ancient sacrifices was fully realized. This view of the nature of Christ's work and of the imputation of his righteousness is pronounced even in our day by Hengstenberg, quote, the foundation doctrine of the gospel, the life point whence sprung the Reformation. Kirchenzeitung, 1836, number 23. End footnote. It is not necessary to pursue this comparison further. If there be any power in language to express thought, if human speech be anything more than an instrument of deception, then these systems of doctrine are distinct and irreconcilable. The one asserts what the other denies. It would be easy to confirm this conclusion by the testimony of the leading advocates of these conflicting creeds. They have stated in a hundred forms that they do not mean the same thing, that the one class rejects and condemns what the other asserts. It is then only by doing despite to all the rules of historical interpretation that any man can pretend that they mean substantially the same thing. What, then, is the theory by which our author proposes to effect the reconciliation of conflicting creeds? According to our understanding of the matter, he presents his theory in two very different forms. One is philosophical and plausible, the other is a truism. The one admits of discussion, the other can be refuted as a means of reconciling creeds only by stating it. The one is this, viz. that right feeling may express itself in diverse, conflicting, and therefore in some cases wrong intellectual forms. The other is that figurative language is not to be interpreted literally. It is the adroit or unconscious interchange of these entirely different forms of his theory that gives at once plausibility and confusion to his discourse. The frequent and sudden transition from a principle which no one denies to one which no orthodox man admits bewilders and deludes his readers. When startled by the fell sweep of his theory in one of its forms, he suddenly turns to them the other, and shows them how perfectly simple and harmless an affair it is. We shall endeavour very briefly to prove, first, that the author does present his theory in both of the forms above stated, and secondly, that in the one form it is false and destructive, and in the other, nugatory. But what is the theory which teaches that right feeling may express itself in diverse and even in wrong intellectual forms? 
The sermon does not present any elaborate exposition or philosophical discussion of it. This was not to be expected in a popular discourse. In order, however, to be properly understood, it is necessary that it should be exhibited somewhat in detail. We do not mean to attribute to Professor Park anything more than the principle itself, as above stated. We do not wish to be understood as even insinuating that he holds either its adjuncts or its consequence. The doctrine is substantially this. Religion consists essentially in feeling. It is not a form of knowledge because, in that case, it could be taught like any other system of knowledge, and the more learned on religious subjects a man is, the more religion he would have. Much less can it consist in willing or acting because there is no moral excellence either in volition or outward action, except as expressive of feeling. Religion must therefore have its seat in the feelings. There is in man a religious sentiment, a sense of dependence, a consciousness of relation to God. This gives rise to the persuasion that God is, and that we stand in manifold relations to him and he to us. This is faith, i.e. a persuasion which arises out of feeling, and which derives from that source its contents and power. This is a form of intuition, a direct vision of its object, apprehending, however, that it is, rather than either how or why it is. To this follows knowledge, that is, the cognitive faculty, the understanding, the logical consciousness, or whatever else it may be called, makes the intuitions included in faith the objects of consideration, interprets and defines them, and thus transmutes them into definite thoughts. Of the materials thus furnished, it constructs theology. In every system of theology, therefore, there are these elements, feeling, faith, knowledge, science. The two former may be the same, where the two latter are very different. Hence, feeling and faith may retain their true Christian character, even when they cannot be reconciled with the philosophical convictions of the mind in which they exist. This provides for the case of the tearful German mentioned by Professor Park, who was a Christian in his heart, but a philosopher, i.e. in this connection an infidel, in his head. Further, with the same religious feeling and faith, there may be very different theologies, because the interpretation given to the intuitions of faith are, to a great extent, determined by the philosophy, the knowledge, cultivation, prejudices, and spirit of the individual, and of the age or church to which he belongs. There is therefore no one Christian theology which can be pronounced true to the exclusion of all others. Different theologies are different forms of expressing, or of interpreting, the same religious sentiment. They are all true. As the force of vegetable life manifests itself in the greatest diversity of forms, and in very different degrees of perfection, so Christianity, which is also a power, manifests itself in various forms of faith, which are all to be recognized as expressions of a genuine Christian consciousness. If religion were a form of knowledge, if Christianity consisted in certain doctrines, or had Christ's immediate object been to set forth a theological system, there could be no room for such diversity. There could be only one true theology. But revelation is not a making known a series of propositions. So far as it is an act of God, it is the arrangements and dispensations by which he awakens and elevates the religious consciousness of men. And so far as it regards the recipients, it is the intuition of the truth consequent on this elevation of their religious feelings. And inspiration is the state of mind, the elevation of the religious consciousness to which this immediate perception of the truth is due. It follows from all this that the scriptures, great as is their value, are only in an indirect sense the rule of faith. They contain the record of the apprehension of divine things consequent on the extraordinary religious life communicated to the world by Jesus Christ, and although they have a certain normal authority as the expression of a very pure and elevated state of religious feeling, still of necessity that expression was greatly modified by the previous culture of the sacred writers. In other words, the form in which they presented these truths, or the interpretation which they gave to their religious intuitions, was influenced by their education, their modes of thought, and by the whole spirit of their age. Our faith, therefore, is only indirectly founded on Scripture. Its immediate basis is our own religious consciousness, awakened and elevated by the Scriptures, and by the life which, proceeding from Christ, dwells in the Church. The simple historical interpretation of the sacred writings does not give us the divine element of the truth therein contained. 
It gives us the temporary logical or intellectual form in which that divine element is embodied. But that form in the progress of the church may have become obsolete. The theology of an age dies with the age. The race passes on. It is making constant progress. Not only is the scientific element which enters into every system of theology becoming more correct, but the religious consciousness of the church is getting more pure and elevated, and therefore a theology suited to one age becomes very unsuitable to another. Such, to the best of our understanding of the matter, is the theory to which the radical principle of Professor Park's sermon belongs. To understand that principle, it was necessary to have some idea of the system of which it is a part. We repeat, however, what we have already said, viz., that we attribute to our author nothing more than he has avowed. We do not say, and we do not know, that he holds the theory above stated in any of its steps, beyond the principle that right feeling may express itself in diverse, inconsistent, and therefore at times erroneous intellectual forms. That he does teach this principle, and that it is all one aspect of the theory by which he proposes to reconcile all allowable creeds, we think plain in the first place from the formal statement of his doctrine. The sermon, from beginning to end, treats of two theologies which differ in form, i.e. in their intellectual statements, but have a common principle. Both are therefore allowable because they are only different expressions of the same thing. It is a matter of perfect indifference whether these are called two theologies or two modes of expressing one and the same theology. The difference between them in either case is the same. Footnote. One of the complaints against us which Professor Park urges most frequently is that we misrepresent him as teaching two kinds of theology instead of two different forms of one and the same theology. After many iterations of this complaint, he loses his patience and asks, quote, Will the reviewer never distinguish between two doctrines and the same doctrine expressed in two forms? End quote. We are afraid not. There is not the slightest difference between the two statements except in words. There are no doctrines so wide apart but that some general truth may be found of which they are but different forms. Atheism is one form and theism is another form of the one doctrine that the universe had a cause. The Socinian and the Church exhibition of the design of Christ's death are but different forms of the one doctrine that we are saved by Christ. It is therefore perfectly immaterial whether Professor Park teaches that there are two theologies or two forms of one and the same theology. His readers understand the former expression precisely as they do the latter, after all his explanations. The former is the more correct and has the usage of all ages in its favour. One great difficulty in regard to this sermon is that its author wishes to change the established meaning of terms and call new things by old words. End footnote. Quote, Sometimes, says our author, both the mind and the heart are suited by the same modes of thought, but often they require dissimilar methods, and the object of the present discourse is to state some of the differences between the theology of the intellect and that of the feeling and also some of the influences which they exert upon each other. End quote, page 534. Quote, the theology of feeling differs from that of the intellect. It is the form of belief which is suggested by and adapted to the wants of the well-trained heart. It is embraced as involving the substance of truth, although when literally interpreted it may or may not be false. End quote, page 535. Quote, in the theology of reason, the progress of science has antiquated some and will continue to modify other refinements. Theory has chased theory into the shades, but the theology of the heart, letting the minor accuracies go for the sake of holding strongly upon the substance of doctrine, need not always accommodate itself to scientific changes, but may use its old statements, even if, when literally understood, they be incorrect. End quote. Page 539. Quote, our theme, he says, reveals the identity in the essence of many systems which are run in scientific or aesthetic moulds unlike each other. There are, indeed, kinds of theology which cannot be reconciled with each other. End quote. Page 559. Quote, Another practical lesson developed in this discourse is the importance of exhibiting the mutual consistency between all the exhibitions of right feeling. End quote. Page 137. We see not how these and many similar declarations are to be understood otherwise than as teaching that the intellectual forms 
under which right feeling expresses itself, may be, and often are, diverse and inconsistent. The difference is not that between literal and figurative language, but between systems run in different scientific moulds. The intellectual forms of doctrine may change, theory may succeed theory, but the feelings may adhere to these antiquated forms and continue to express themselves in modes which the reason pronounces to be false. But, in the second place, a large class of the illustrations employed by our author puts this matter out of all doubt. They are instances not of figurative, imaginative, or intense expressions, but of purely intellectual and doctrinal statements. This we have already abundantly proved. That the sin of Adam is imputed to his posterity, that they are condemned for that sin, that its consequences to them are of the nature of punishment, is a different doctrine from that expressed by saying we are exposed to evil in consequence of that sin. That inherent depravity is truly and properly sin, is a different intellectual proposition from the statement that it is not properly sin. That no mere man since the fall is able perfectly to keep the commandments of God is a different doctrine from that asserted by saying that God never requires of us more than we are able to perform. These statements suppose different theories of moral obligation, of moral agency, and of the freedom of the will. So too the propositions Christ bore the penalty of the law his sufferings were of the nature of punishment, he fully satisfied the demands of the law and the justice of God, are recognized forms of stating a doctrine concerning the atonement, which has ever been held to be incompatible with the governmental or Socinian theory of the nature of Christ's work, as these and others of a like kind are included in the author's illustrations of his theory, they prove beyond doubt that his theory is that right feeling may express itself in diverse and inconsistent intellectual forms. It matters not what name he may give it. It is the precise doctrine of those who hold that the different systems of theology are not to be distinguished as true and false, but as different interpretations of the same genuine Christian consciousness, or that right feeling may express itself in incompatible intellectual forms. Footnote. When the writers to whom we have referred represent conflicting systems of theology as alike true, they of course mean that there is a higher view which embraces and harmonizes them all, that they are different aspects of the same general truth, and further that they have a common element which is differently combined in these several systems. They would accept Professor Park's statement of the identity in essence of systems run on different scientific moulds, or of, quote, the mutual consistency of all the expressions of right feeling, end quote, as a proper expression of their doctrine. End footnote. This is the philosophical, grave, and plausible aspect of our author's theory. He presents the matter, however, in another and very different light. The second form in which the doctrine of the sermon is presented is that figurative language is not to be interpreted literally, that poetry is not to be treated as prose. This, as a device for reconciling all allowable creeds, as we have said above, needs no refutation beyond the statement of it that our author does run down his theory to this infinite little, is plain both from his exposition and illustration of his doctrine. The emotive theology may, he says, be called poetry. Quote, if this word be used as it should be to include the constitutional developments of a heart moved to its depths by the truth. And, as in its essence it is poetical, with this meaning of the epithet, so it avails itself of a poetic license and indulges in a style of remark which, for sober prose, would be unbecoming, or even, when associated in certain ways, irreverent. End quote. Being poetical in its nature, the theology of feeling is better adapted to the hymn book than to creeds. He ascribes a great deal of mischief to the introduction of the language of poetry into doctrinal symbols. Men, he says, will never find peace quote, until they confine their intellect to its rightful sphere and understand it according to what it does and their feeling to its province, and interpret its language according to what it means, rendering to poetry the things which are designed for poetry, and unto prose that which belongs to prose. End quote. Our theme, i.e. the theme discussed in the sermon, he says, quote, grieves us by disclosing the ease with which we may slide into grave errors. Such errors have arisen from so simple a cause as that of confounding poetry with prose. End quote. 
the emotive theology, as appears from these statements, is poetry. It is the poetic exhibition of doctrines. The conflicts of theologians arise, in a measure, from their not recognizing this fact. They interpret these poetic forms as though they were the sober and wary language of prose. He sustains the doctrine of the sermon, in this view of it, by quotations from Blair, Campbell, Burke, and even a certain commentary on the epistle to the Romans. Quote, in accordance with these simple principles, he says, not dug out of the depths of German metaphysics, but taken from the surface of Blair's rhetoric, the sermon under review describes the theology of feeling as introducing obscure images, vague and indefinite representations. End quote. The doctrine of the discourse, therefore, is the perfectly harmless truism that poetry is not prose, and therefore is not to be interpreted as though it were. Accordingly, he asks the commentator referred to how it happens that when he, quote, comes to criticize a New England sermon, he should forget the rhetorical principles with which he was once familiar, end quote. These representations present the author's theory as a simple rhetorical principle, which no one denies. A large class of the illustrations of the doctrine of the sermon are adapted to the view of the case, Passages of scripture which speak of men as hiding under Jehovah's wings, which represent God as jealous or angry, which speak of him as a rock or a high tower, or which describe him as armed with sword and buckler. The figurative language of our hymn books which speaks of God's burning throne, his smiling face, his open arms, the intense and hyperbolical language of emotion, as when the psalmist says, I am a worm and no man, and when the sinner says, I am less than nothing are all cited as illustrations of the principle contended for. There can therefore be no doubt that one aspect of our author's theory is that poetry is not to be interpreted as though it were prose. But is this the only aspect of his doctrine? Was it with this penny-whistle he discoursed such music as stole away the senses of a Boston audience? When he stood up as a vates proescius venturi to foretell the blending of all creeds into one colourless ray and to predict the end of religious controversy, was Blair's rhetoric the source of his inspiration? Did he persuade the shrewd Athenians of America that it was a feasible matter to interpret the Westminster Confession as a poem, and that men never would have peace until that feat was accomplished? Such is the modest interpretation which he gives his, quote, humble convention sermon, end quote. We entertain for it a much higher opinion. We believe it teaches something more than lies on the surface of the Scotch principle's dull lectures. If it does not, then we grudge the ink, worth less than a farthing we have spent in writing about it. Footnote. Yet the author seems to labour through this whole reply to persuade his readers that this is all he meant. This is the source of his retorts and sarcasms. Quote, do you hold that God is a rock, or that he came from Teman? Do you forget your own principle that figurative expressions are not to be taken according to the letter? What pitiable logomachy, then, is it to contend about doctrinal discrepancies? Cannot is only another form of will not. Sinful is only a figure for not sinful. End quote. If we all admit we are saved by Christ, what is the use of disputing how he saves? We are all agreed if we did but know it. You say the thing figuratively, I say the same thing literally. I mean just what you mean, mean what you please, within allowable limits. End footnote. It is the principle that right feeling may express itself in wrong intellectual forms. Incorrect and dangerous as that principle is, that gives dignity and importance to the sermon under review. This is a grave matter. The theory with which it is connected is not to be treated lightly. It has been elaborated with so much skill, sustained by so much power, and adopted by so many leading minds, that it deserves the most serious examination. It would be a very important service if some competent hand would undertake such a scrutiny, and philosophically discuss the various points which the theory in question involves, separating the warp of truth from the woof of error in its complicated texture. No one can read even the bald outline of that theory as given above without feeling its power and seeing that there is an element of truth in it which gives it a dangerous plausibility. We must leave such an examination, however, to those whom God calls to the work. We have an humbler office. There are two methods of dealing with a false theory. The one is the refutation of its principles. 
the other is to show that its admitted results are in conflict with established truths. The latter is much the shorter and generally much the more satisfactory, as it is the common scriptural method of dealing with error. We propose therefore simply to indicate one or two points in which the theory, one of whose principles our author has adopted, stands in conflict with the Bible. In the first place, the radical principle of the theory, viz. that religion consists essentially in feeling, is contrary to the scriptural doctrine on the subject, and is opposed to what the Bible teaches of the importance of truth. According to scripture, religion is not a blind feeling, desire, or emotion, but it is a form of knowledge. It is the spiritual discernment of divine things. The knowledge, which in the Bible is declared to be eternal or spiritual life, is not the mere intellectual or speculative apprehension of the truth, but such apprehension is one of its essential elements, and therefore of true religion. No man can have the spiritual discernment of any truth which he does not know. The intellectual cognition is just as necessary to spiritual knowledge as the visual perception of a beautiful object is to the apprehension of its beauty. Men cannot be made religious by mere instruction, but they cannot be religious without it. Religion includes the knowledge, i.e. the intellectual apprehension of divine things, as one of its essential elements, without which it cannot exist and therefore it is often called knowledge. Hence to know God is the sum of all religion. The vision of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is the vital principle of inward Christianity. Hence throughout the Bible the knowledge of God, wisdom, understanding, and words of like import are used as designations of true religion. With spiritual discernment is inseparably connected a feeling corresponding to the nature of the object apprehended. This is so intimately united with the cognition as to be an attribute of it, having no separate existence and being inconceivable without it. And it is to the two as inseparably united that the name of religion properly belongs. Neither the cognition without the feeling, nor the feeling without the cognition, completes the idea of religion. It is the complex state of mind in which those elements are inseparably blended so as to form one glowing intelligent apprehension of divine things which constitutes spiritual life. But in this complex state the cognition is the first and the governing element to which the other owes its existence, and therefore in the second place the scriptures not only teach that knowledge is an essential constituent of religion but also that the objective presentation of truth to the mind is absolutely necessary to any genuine religious feeling or affection. It is by the truth as thus outwardly presented that the inward state of mind, which constitutes religion, is produced. We are begotten by the truth, we are sanctified by the truth. It is by the exhibition of the truth that the inward life of the soul is called into being and into exercise. This is the agency which the Spirit of God employs in the work of conversion and sanctification, Hence, truth is essential to the salvation of men. It is not a matter of indifference what men believe, or in what form right feeling expresses itself. There can be no right feeling but what is due to the apprehension of truth. Hence, Christ commissioned his disciples to teach. The church was made the teacher of the nations. She has ever regarded herself as the witness and guardian of the truth. Heresy she has repudiated, not as an insult to her authority, but as destructive of her life. Is not this scriptural view of the relation between knowledge and feeling confirmed by consciousness and experience? Is not the love of God intelligent? Is it not complacency in the divine character as intellectually apprehended? Does not the love of Christ suppose the knowledge of Christ? Can the man who looks upon him as a creature feel toward him as God manifest in the flesh? Can the feeling which has for its object the Son of God bearing our sins in his own body on the cross be the same as that which regards him as an amiable martyr? Repentance, faith, love, reverence, gratitude, every affection and exercise which enters into true religion, our own consciousness tells us, derives its character and owes its existence to knowledge, to the intelligent apprehension of the truth as revealed in the word of God. The history of the world is a continued illustration of the truth that inward character depends on knowledge. This is one of the great principles of Protestantism, and therefore Protestants have ever been the advocates of religious instruction. It is a purely Romish doctrine that, quote, religious light is intellectual darkness. Footnote. Newman's Parochial Sermons, Volume 1, page 124, end footnote. 
Knowledge, according to Protestants, is one of the elements of faith without which it cannot exist. It includes assent to some known truth. In the one church, therefore, truth has a paramount importance. In the other, ignorance is regarded as the mother of devotion. If a man trust in the cross, the Romish system tells him he need not know what the cross means. It matters not whether he thinks he is saved by the wood of the cross, by the magic influence of the sign, or by Christ as crucified for the sins of the world. These are different expressions of the feeling of confidence. A distinguished Unitarian clergyman once said to us that there was no difference between his doctrine as to the method of salvation and that of the Orthodox. Both believe that we are saved through Christ and even by his death. The one says how this is done, the other leaves the manner unexplained. The general truth both receive. The difference is not a difference of doctrine, but of the mode or form in which the same doctrine is presented. In opposition to the scriptural doctrine on the subject, the theory under consideration teaches that religion consists in feeling, as distinguished from knowledge, and that it is, in a great measure, independent of it. In the extreme form in which this doctrine is presented by its great master, it is immaterial, so far as religion is concerned, whether a man be a pantheist or theist, whether he regards God as a mere force, of which neither intelligence nor moral excellence can be predicated, or as a spirit, infinite in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And even in the more moderate form in which it is set forth by some of his followers, truth is of subordinate importance. As the essence of religion is feeling, it may exist under very different intellectual forms and find expression in conflicting systems of doctrine. Both, therefore, as to the nature of religion and as to the importance of truth, there is a vital difference between this theory and the teachings of the Word of God. Secondly, this theory subverts the doctrine of a divine revelation in the correct and commonly received sense of those terms. Revelation is the communication of truth by God to the understandings of men. It makes known doctrines. For example, it makes known that God is, that God is a spirit, that he is infinite, that he is holy, just, and good, that Christ is the Son of God, that he assumed our nature, that he died for our sins, etc. These are logical propositions. They are so set forth that the meaning of the terms employed and the sense of the propositions themselves are understood and understood in the same way by the renewed and the unrenewed that the one class perceive in the truths thus revealed an excellence and experience from them a power of which the other class have no experience does not alter the case. Revelation as such is addressed to the understanding, to the understanding indeed of moral beings capable of perceiving the import of moral propositions. But it is very different from spiritual illumination. All this the theory in question denies, it makes revelation to be the awakening and elevating the religious feelings, which, when thus roused, have higher intuitions of spiritual things than were possible before. Doctrines are not matters of revelation. They have no divine authority. They are constructed by the understanding. They are the logical statements of the supposed contents of these immediate intuitions, and are therefore fallible, transient, variable, assuming one form under one set of influences and a different under another. Thirdly, this theory necessarily destroys the authority of the scriptures. This follows from what has already been said. If it subverts the true idea of revelation, it subverts all that rests on that idea. But, besides this, it teaches that the influence under which the sacred writers thought and wrote was not peculiar to them. It is common to all believers. Inspiration is an exalted state of the religious feelings, quickening and rendering clearer the religious perceptions. The light within is therefore coordinate with the light in the scriptures. This theory is a philosophical form of Quakerism and stands in much the same relation to the normal authority of the scriptures. The practical operation of this doctrine confirms the view here given of its nature and tendency. There is, of course, a great difference among its advocates as to the reverence which they manifest for the word of God and as to the extent in which they agree with its teachings but in all there is abundant evidence that the Bible has lost its ancient authority as a rule of faith. They construct systems which do not profess to be expositions of what is taught in the word of God, but deductions from the religious consciousness as it now exists. Few of them hesitate to say that the Bible is full of errors, not merely of history and science, but of such as are concerned with religion. 
that it is disfigured by misconceptions, false reasoning, and erroneous exhibitions of doctrine. How can it be otherwise if its logical propositions are but the fallible interpretation given to their feelings by the sacred writers? Our readers cannot ask us to say more in opposition to a theory which thus deals with the scriptures, which represents its doctrinal statements as due to the peculiar training of the sacred writers, and which teaches that propositions categorically opposed to each other may be alike true. True relatively, since none is true absolutely. Professor Park may ask, what has all this to do with his convention sermon? That discourse does not teach that all religion consists in feeling, nor does it advocate the view of revelation and inspiration deduced from that principle. Very true, but it does teach one of the main principles of the theory in question. It does teach that right feeling may express itself in inconsistent intellectual forms. Does it not teach that we may say the sin of Adam is imputed to his race, that our nature since the fall is sinful, that Christ's sufferings were of the nature of punishment, that he satisfied the law and justice of God, etc., and yet are not all these propositions pronounced to be false in the very sense which those who use them mean to convey? Is it not the avowed design of the sermon to show that all allowable creeds may be reconciled? Does not the author attempt to show that the two great systems of doctrine which have been in conflict for ages are but different forms of expressing the same right feelings? If this is so, we know no method of refutation, more fair or more conclusive, than to point out the origin and to trace the consequences of a principle by which these results are brought about. To object to an argument designed to show that a doctrine is false by proving that the principles which it involves and the consequences to which it leads are unsound and dangerous is to object to its being refuted at all. End of section 31《セクション32 of Essays and Reviews by Charles Hodge》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Theology of the Intellect and That of the Feelings, Article 3 Footnote Unity and diversities of belief, even on imputed and involuntary sin, with comments on a second article in the Princeton Review relating to a convention sermon by Edwards A. Park, Abbot Professor in Andover Theological Seminary, Bibliotheca Sacra, July 1851, pages 594 to 647. Princeton Review, October 1851. End footnote. It is not our intention to reply to the long article of which the title is given above. Our object in what follows is to present in few words our reasons for putting an end to the discussion between Professor Park and ourselves, so far as we are concerned. His convention sermon presented three legitimate topics for discussion. 1. The nature of the theory therein proposed. 2. The correctness of that theory. and 3. Its value as a general solvent of all allowable creeds. We have endeavoured to adhere strictly to these points. In that sermon, our author set forth a theory which he seemed to think new and important. He applied that theory to neutralize some of the great doctrines of the Bible. It was incumbent on those to whom those doctrines are dear, and who saw them evaporating in Professor Park's alembic into thin air, to examine the nature of the process and to ascertain whether it was a real discovery or only another pain light. Professor Park is very importune in urging that we should drop this subject and take up a very different one. After presenting in an interrogative form a variety of objections to the doctrine of inherent sin, he says, quote, We request an answer to these questions as a favour. We are entitled to demand such answer as a right. End quote. We cannot accept this challenge. It may suit Professor Park's purpose to divert attention from the real point at issue, but we are not disposed to aid him in the attempt. In our preceding article, we distinctly stated the subject we intended to discuss. After presenting an outline of the two great systems of doctrine which have so long been in conflict, we said, quote, The question is not which of the antagonistic systems of theology above described is true, or whether either is true, nor is the question which of the two Professor Park believes. His own faith has nothing to do with the question. The point to be considered is not so much a doctrinal one as a principle of interpretation, a theory of exegesis and its application. 
The question is whether there is any correct theory of interpretation by which the two systems above referred to can be harmonized. Are they two theologies equally true, the one the theology of the intellect, the other the theology of the feelings? Or, in other words, are they different forms of one and the same theology? End quote. On the same page, we say, we proposed, one, to show that the above statement of the question was correct, i.e. that Professor Park had really undertaken the task of reconciling the Augustinian and anti-Augustinian systems of theology, two, to consider the success of this attempt, and three, to examine the nature of the theory by which that reconciliation has been attempted. The prosecution of this plan involved the careful statement of the doctrines to be harmonized by the new theory, but it excluded a discussion of the truth of those doctrines. When, therefore, Professor Park calls upon us with such authority to answer his objections to the doctrine of original or inherent sin, he is travelling out of the record. Again, where is the matter to end? The two systems which Professor Park proposes to harmonise embrace almost the whole range of theology in its two great departments of anthropology and soteriology. Are we to go over the whole of this ground? Must we write a system of polemic theology in answer to a convention sermon? This is a great deal more than we bargained for. When we ran out of the harbour in our yacht to see what long, low, black schooner was making such a smoke in the offing, we had no expectation to be called upon to double Cape Horn. Our author, indeed, confines his present challenge to the discussion of imputed and involuntary sin, but these are only two out of a long concatenation of doctrines embraced in these systems, and if we admit his right to demand a discussion of these at our hands, we concede his right to keep us busy to the end of our days. We beg to be excused. Our relation to Adam, the effect of his sin upon his posterity, the nature of sin, ability and inability, regeneration, grace, predestination and election, the work of Christ, justification, faith and perseverance, topics on which thousands of volumes have been written, are some of the subjects on which Professor Park assumes the right to call us out at pleasure. This is one of the numerous mistakes into which our author has been betrayed by a want of due discrimination. The truth of his theory and the truth of Augustinianism are two very different things. We are open to all fair demands as to the former, but we never volunteered to defend Gibraltar against his attacks. Again, where is the necessity for any such discussion? Why should we again go over ground rendered hard by the footsteps of generations? Why discuss anew questions which have been debated every ten years since the days of Augustine. Why trouble ourselves to pick up and send back spent balls which have been discharged a thousand times before to no purpose? Every generation has indeed its own life to live. It must fight out its own battles, which are only a repetition of the conflicts of former ages. The same great questions are constantly recurring and must be settled anew by every seeking soul but these are mostly personal struggles. The doctrines are fixed. They have taken their place in the settled faith of the church, and the real struggle is in the breast of each individual to come to a comprehension, appreciation, and acknowledgement of the truth. To help such individuals in their inward conflicts, to vindicate the faith from misapprehension, to commend it fairly to the acceptance of men, is now, in great measure, the work of the theological teacher. There is a God, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three persons, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, that God was manifested in the flesh for the redemption of man, that Jesus Christ our Lord is very God and very man, in two distinct natures and one person for ever, that he died for our sins and rose again for our justification, that we are saved by faith in Christ as the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us, that the race whose nature he assumed, and whom he gave his life to redeem, is a fallen race, born in sin, by nature the children of wrath, under condemnation from their birth, infected with a sinful depravity of nature, by which they are disabled and indisposed to all spiritual good, and therefore must be born again, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, are no longer open questions among Christians." These doctrines are part of the settled faith of Christendom, included in the creeds of all churches, Greek, Latin, Lutheran, and Reformed. We are aware that these doctrines are liable to assault from various quarters, and that every man should be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in him. But this is no reason why we should treat the whole Christian system 
as something unsettled, to be discussed anew with every individual who may choose to assail any of its fundamental principles. It is time that men should feel and acknowledge that assaults against matters of common faith are attacks not against opinions of men but against Christianity, so that the position of the assailant may be defined from the beginning. If the point assailed can be shown to be part of the common faith of the church, then we think the necessity for further debate is, in all ordinary cases, at an end. We hold to no infallibility of the church, but we hold to the certain truth of what all Christians believe. The fact of their agreement admits of no other solution than the teaching of the Spirit of Truth, who dwells in all believers. We regard it, therefore, as a matter of great importance that such questions should not be open, at least within the church, i.e. among Christians, to perpetual renewed agitation. The church has new conflicts enough before her, without fighting over and over her former battles. Again, there is nothing new as to substance or form in Professor Park's objections to call for special attention. They are presented somewhat more rhetorically than usual, but with less than common logical force and discrimination. They are the old, ever-recurring, and constantly repeated difficulties, which arise partly from the nature of the subject, and partly from the apparent impossibility of disabusing the mind of misconceptions to which it has become wedded. Language is at best an imperfect vehicle of thought, and when men have become accustomed to associate certain ideas with certain terms, they find it very difficult to free themselves from such trammels. There is a large class of words to which Professor Park attaches a meaning different from that in which they are used by theologians of the Reformed Church, and he therefore unavoidably misunderstands and misrepresents their doctrines. To this class of terms belong such words as imputation, guilt, punishment, condemnation, satisfaction, justification, nature, natural, moral, disposition, voluntary, etc., in numerous cases he perverts these words from their established sense, and then pronounces judgment with the greatest confidence on doctrinal propositions of whose meaning he has no distinct apprehension. If instead of reading here and there a page in Turretin, through dark green spectacles which turn everything into spectres, he would read his whole work through with unclouded eyes, he would find himself in a new world and would be saved the trouble of asking a multitude of irrelevant questions. We will give specimens of the professor's objections to justify our description of their character. He represents the doctrine of the imputation of Adam's sin, for example, as involving an unintelligible oneness of the race with Adam, an assumption that men sinned before they existed, that the moral character of the act imputed is transferred, that men, being regarded as morally guilty of Adam's sin, are, contrary to all justice, punished for it. The true doctrine on this subject is nothing more or less than that the sin of Adam is the judicial ground of the condemnation of his race. There is no mysterious oneness of the race, no transfer of moral character, no assumption of the moral guilt of men for the sin of Adam involved in the doctrine. Professor Park knows this, for he himself makes the question on this subject to be, whether God exercises distributive justice or sovereignty towards us in causing us to suffer for the sin of Adam. If then our author is able for himself thus to eliminate the unessential elements of this doctrine, why does he overload it with all his queries and difficulties about oneness, transfer of character, etc., etc.? If, as Professor Park says, the whole dispute is about the word punishment, or, in other words, whether the evils brought upon our race by the sin of Adam be judicial or sovereign inflictions, then imputation does not involve any transfer of the moral character of the act imputed. This is still further plain, not only from the explicit declarations of the advocates of the doctrine, but also from the notorious fact that no other imputation of the offence of Adam is acknowledged or contended for than is asserted when it is said, our sins were imputed to Christ, and his righteousness is imputed to believers. Everyone knows it would be a gross calumny against the Lutheran and Reformed churches to say they teach the transfer of moral turpitude or moral ill-desert to the Lord Jesus, or of the moral excellence of his righteousness to his people. The imputation of sin to Christ did not render him unholy, nor does the imputation of his righteousness render us holy. 
Why then should it be contended that the imputation of Adam's sin renders his race morally guilty of his transgression? As to the objection that it is unjust to condemn men for a sin not personally their own, there are three modes of answer. First, it may be shown that the objection bears with aggravated force against those who deny the doctrine of imputation. They admit that evils, only less than infinite, come upon the race in consequence of Adam's sin, that God as a sovereign determined that, if Adam sinned, all his race should sin. He decreed to bring men into existence with such a constitution of their nature, and under such circumstances, as to render their becoming sinners absolutely certain, and then to condemn them to eternal misery for the sin thus committed, in the first dawn of reason. All this is done in sovereignty. The other doctrine teaches that the evils which afflict our race on account of Adam's sin are part of the just penalty of that transgression. Professor Park himself says, quote, Our calamities hang suspended on the sovereign purpose of heaven. We say directly. He, his reviewer, says indirectly. We say without any intervening links. He says with the intervening links of imputation, guilt, etc. End quote. When we first read this sentence, we could hardly believe that Professor Park had been given up to speak the truth thus simply and clearly. It is precisely as he states it. A man is put to death, he says, by a sovereign act. We say, with the trifling intermediate links of guilt and just condemnation, he is welcome to all the converts he can make by this statement of his case. A second method of answering this charge of injustice is to show that it bears against undeniable facts in the providence of God. It is vain to say anything is wrong which God actually does. It is a plain fact that the penalty threatened against Adam in case of transgression has been inflicted on his posterity. Death, the pains of childbirth, the unfruitfulness of the earth, all the visible manifestations of God's displeasure fell upon the race as well as upon the original transgressors. These evils were denounced as a curse, as a penalty, and as such they have come on all mankind. A third answer to this objection is found in the express declarations of Scripture. The Bible does not say we are merely pardoned by a sovereign act on account of Christ's death, but that we are justified by His blood. Neither does it say we suffer certain evils inflicted in a sovereign manner of which Adam's sin is the occasion, but it says we are condemned for that sin. If justification means more than pardon, then condemnation means more than the sovereign infliction of evil. This is Paul's method of answering difficulties. If an objection can be shown to bear against the providence or the word of God, it is thereby handed up to a higher tribunal, where the objector can prosecute it, or not, as he sees fit. Another subject on which our author has many difficulties is the doctrine of inability, or the denial of the doctrine, quote, that ability limits responsibility, that men are responsible only so far as they have adequate power to do what is required of them, that they are responsible for nothing that is not under the control of the will, end quote. On this subject, there are three forms of doctrine, more or less prevalent in this country. The first is that of plenary or adequate power. The second, the doctrine that man is naturally able, but morally unable to keep the commandments of God. The third, the doctrine that since the fall, men are both indisposed and disabled to all spiritual good. The symbols of the Lutheran and Reformed churches, which inculcate this last-mentioned view of the subject, clearly teach, first, that since the fall, man retains all his faculties of soul and body, and is therefore still a free moral agent. Second, that he not only has the power of choosing or refusing what is agreeable or disagreeable, but has the power of performing things civilly good. The inability asserted is restricted to things spiritually good, or things connected with salvation. Thirdly, that this inability arises out of the sinful state of the soul and is removed by spiritual regeneration and the cooperation of the Holy Ghost. The second form of this doctrine mentioned above is a kind of neutral ground and is a very convenient hiding and dodging place. Many who profess that view of the subject mean by natural ability nothing more than what the old theologians mean by man's free agency and by moral inability they mean what those divines intend when they say men are since the fall disabled and indisposed to all spiritual good. 
On the other hand, however, there are many who understand by natural ability plenary power, and the only inability which they admit is a disinclination which it is in the power of the will, i.e. of the sinner, in the exercise of his natural strength, to remove with regard to Professor Park's objections to the old doctrine on this subject, we have but three remarks to make. First, most of his difficulties arise from his not understanding the question. He overlooks the limitations and explanations of the doctrine given in the Protestant confessions. We no more believe than Professor Park does that men can be under obligation to create a world by their own power. The old doctrine does not represent the inability of the sinner as being the same in kind, though as invincible in decree, as that of the blind to see, or of the deaf to hear. The inability of the blind to see does not arise out of their moral state, has not reference to moral acts, and is not removed by a moral change. It is therefore of an entirely different nature from the inability under which the sinner is represented to labour. The objection, therefore, which takes for granted their identity is simply an argumentum ad ignorantium. Secondly, whether men are or are not able of themselves to do all that God requires is a question of fact, and is to be determined accordingly. Where is the man who has ever regenerated himself? Where is the man who has loved God perfectly even for one hour, much less for a lifetime? Where is the sinner who, by any exercise of his natural strength, though in imminent danger of perdition, can turn himself unto God? Let Professor Park, with all his boasted power, go on his knees and utter ten sentences in a manner to satisfy his own conscience. He knows he could not do it, if the salvation of the world depended on it. The plain, simple fact of consciousness and observation is that men cannot do what they know they are bound to do, and every denial of this fact is either palpably false, or true only in an esoteric and deluding sense. As every man knows that his affections are not under the control of his will, the only way to sustain the doctrine that ability is the measure of obligation is to take the ground that we are not responsible for our affections, that the command to love is absurd, and then the very foundation of religion and morals is overthrown. Thirdly, as the scriptures nowhere tell men they can regenerate themselves, but expressly declare that the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit of God, so that blessed agent in leading men to a knowledge of themselves uniformly convinces them of their entire helplessness, i.e. that they cannot of themselves repent, believe, or even think any good thought. It is not a matter of surprise, therefore, that the doctrine of adequate power, or that men, quote, can, by their natural strength, turn themselves unto God, end quote, is repudiated as anti-Christian no less by Romanists than by Protestants. It is just as abhorrent to the theology of New England as it is to that of the Reformed Church. It is, however, on the subject of involuntary sin that Professor Park is most zealous, and on which he seems most confident of carrying the public sympathy with him. The term involuntary is not very happily chosen, as it is used in very different senses. Anything may be said to be voluntary which inheres in the will, or which flows from an act of the will, or which consists in such an act. Then again, the word will may be taken to include all the active powers of the mind, so that all liking and disliking are acts of the will, or it may be taken in the stricter sense for the imperative faculty of the mind, or power of self-determination. In this sense, only acts of choice, volitions, generic or imperative, are acts of the will. To say that all sin is voluntary in the first of these senses is a very different thing from saying it is voluntary in the sense last mentioned. Yet it is easy and very tempting to quote, as Professor Park does, Augustine's admission that all sin is voluntary in one sense, as an authority for teaching it is voluntary in a sense which would overthrow the whole of that father's system. On this subject of original sin we have in this country three principal forms of doctrine. The first is founded on the principle that all sin consists in the voluntary transgression of known laws. Whence it follows that whatever may be the condition of human nature since the fall, there is nothing of the nature of sin in man until, in his own person, he voluntarily transgresses the law of God. 
The second is the exercise scheme, which, assuming that the soul itself is a series of exercises, teaches that moral agency begins at the commencement of the existence of the soul, and that since the fall, all moral exercises, though created by God, are sinful, until, at regeneration, a holy series is commenced. The third is the common doctrine that men derive from Adam a sinful nature, i.e. that they are born destitute of original righteousness and with unholy dispositions or principles, which corruption of nature is commonly called original sin. This, beyond the possibility of doubt, is the doctrine embodied in the symbols, inculcated in the teaching and implied in the rites of every Christian church. Our author indeed says that some theologians have taught this doctrine. Some indeed. He might as well admit that some men have eyes. True or false, the doctrine of inherent, hereditary, sinful corruption of human nature since the fall is part of the faith of the whole church. In assailing that doctrine, Professor Park arrays himself not against some theologians but against the Christian world, and he should have the courage to acknowledge his position. He denies a doctrine, the rejection of which, connected with the assertion of plenary powers, Edwards says, does away with the necessity of redemption. He puts himself in special opposition to the faith of the New England churches, for the New England divines, the less they made of imputation, the more stress did they lay on inherent sin. Most of Professor Park's objections to this doctrine belong to one or the other of two classes. They either arise from misapprehension, or they involve a petitio principi. The source of a large part of them is indicated in the following sentence. Quote, a thorough Calvinist can no more believe in the passive sin of the heart than he can believe in the sin of the muscles and veins. End quote. It is assumed that nature means the essence of the soul with its constitutional faculties and sensibilities. A sinful nature, therefore, must mean a sinful substance, something made. Hence the objections about physical depravity, God's being the author of sin, the absurdity of men being responsible for the make of their souls, etc., etc. All these objections are swept away by the simple remark that nature in such connection means natural disposition and is expressly declared not to mean essence or substance. Cannot a man have a new nature without having a new soul? Cannot we believe in a holy nature without believing in holy muscles? In every rudimental treatise on original sin, our author will find distinctions and definitions which ought to have precluded the possibility of his advancing such objections as these. Another class of his difficulties arises from his taking for granted there can be no such thing as moral dispositions, as distinct from active preferences. To him it appears an axiom that all sin consists in sinning. Quote, what, he asks, is the passive voice of the verb sin? What is the inactive form of the word evildoers? Why is language made without any such phrases as to endure or suffer criminality without any criminal volition? End quote. These are some of the questions to which he says he has a right to demand an answer. We would reply with all seriousness and respect that years ago, when we were harassed by the same difficulties, we derived more satisfaction from Edwards on the religious affections and from his work on original sin than from any other source. We there found a philosophical exhibition of the nature of dispositions, principles, or habits as distinguished from acts, and a clear demonstration that such dispositions, whether innate, infused, or acquired, may have a moral character. The venerable father of New England theology taught us that it was not, quote, necessary that there should first be thought, reflection, or choice before there can be any virtuous disposition, end quote, and therefore that it is not inconsistent with the nature of virtue that Adam should be created, quote, with holy principles and dispositions, end quote. He showed us that, as it was possible for Adam to be holy before any act of preference, so it is possible for man to be unholy before any such act. He made it plain to us that the scriptures everywhere inculcate the doctrine that there may be and are moral principles distinct from moral acts and antecedent to them, in the distinction which they make between the tree and its fruits, between the heart and the thoughts, feelings, and preferences which proceed out of it, 
and in their description of the natural state of men as born in sin, and by nature the children of wrath, in their representing even infants as needing redemption and regeneration, and in their account of a new birth as the infusion of a new life, a holy principle, inherent and permanent, as the source of all holy preferences, feelings, words, and works. He pointed out to us a fact which seems to have escaped Professor Park's notice, viz. that all human languages, so far as known, bear the impress of this distinction between moral principles and moral acts. A good or bad man means something more than a man whose preferences are good or bad, whose acts are right or wrong. It is implied in such expressions that there are certain abiding moral states which constitute a man's character and afford ground of assurance what his acts will be. He further showed us how deeply this doctrine entered into the religious experience of God's people and how intimately it is connected with the whole scheme of redemption. It is not for us to retail his arguments, but we apprise Professor Park that if he hopes to succeed in his present course or to carry with him the sympathy and confidence of New England, the first thing he has to do is to answer Edwards on the will, Edwards on the affections, and Edwards on original sin. When he has done this, it will be time enough to come all the way down to us. In the meanwhile, we think it best to step aside and let him face his real antagonist. Our first general reason, then, for discontinuing this discussion is that our author, instead of adhering to the true question in debate, wishes to introduce a doctrinal controversy for which we feel no vocation and see no occasion. Our second reason is to be found in his manner of conducting the discussion. He represents our articles as little else than a series of misstatements and our method of argument as little better than nicknaming. See pages 6 to 8 and 605 at Pasim. He will not, therefore, object to our respectfully pointing out some particulars in which it appears to us he has come short. In the first place, we think his articles are, to a great degree, characterized by evasions and playing with words. For example, one point of distinction between the two systems of theology is that the one teaches that the sufferings of Christ were penal, the other that they were simply didactic, that is, designed to exhibit truth and make a moral impression. This point is evaded by the remark that the author only denied that Christ suffered the entire penalty of the law, which his reviewer must admit, as he does not hold that Christ suffered remorse. Another point of difference is as to whether the law of God is set aside in the salvation of sinners, or whether its demands are satisfied by the righteousness of Christ. This corner is turned by saying that what he rejects is complete satisfaction, which his reviewer cannot maintain, as he admits the law to be still binding as a rule of duty. Again, the theology of the intellect, we are told, would not suggest the unqualified remark that Christ has fully paid the debt of sinners. Here, the pirouette is performed on the word unqualified, and the real point is left untouched. To such an extent is this word play carried that language seems in his hands to lose its meaning. He can make anything out of anything. In his former article, setting up himself and his reviewer as representatives of opposite systems, he showed that there was nothing the latter could say in the matter of doctrine, which he could not say too. And in the present article, he, quote, avows before the wide world, end quote, his hearty belief that we are regarded and treated as sinners on account of Adam's sin, that we are punished for it, by which, he says, he means that we, quote, are not punished in the most proper sense, end quote. See page 623. Thus the words satisfaction, impute, ability, inability, etc., etc., are kept going up and down like a juggler's balls until no man can tell what they mean or whether they have any meaning at all. We feel ourselves to be no match for our author in such a game as this, and therefore give the matter up. He may keep the balls going, and we will take our place among the admiring spectators. In the second place, we object to the personal character which he has given the discussion. The only interest which our readers can be presumed to take in this matter relates to the truths concerned. But our author seems far more anxious to prove that his reviewer contradicts himself and agrees with him than to establish the truth of his theory. This ad hominem method of argument is greatly commended by our author's friends and considered very effective. 
were he ever so successful in his attempts to convict his reviewer of self-contradiction, we cannot see that he would be much the better for it. His theory would remain unproved and its evil tendencies uncounteracted. In our partial judgment, however, our author nowhere appears to less advantage than in these personal attacks. To make sure of his object, he goes back twenty years and ascribes to us articles in this review, some of which we probably never even read. Taking such a sweep as this, it is hard that he should catch nothing. We will select what we consider the most plausible examples of self-contradiction, examples over which our author has specially triumphed, and show in few words the source of his mistake. In our former article we denied that ability or adequate power is the measure of obligation. As a direct contradiction to this, he quotes from the biblical repertory for 1831 the passage, quote, Man cannot be under obligation to do what requires powers which do not belong to his nature and constitution. End quote. This, he says, ends the strife. These propositions are not only perfectly consistent, but it is the express object of the writer of the article for 1831 to teach the very doctrine that inability is not the measure of obligation, and this Professor Park could not possibly fail to see and know if he read the article he quotes. The above propositions are consistent, for the one does not affirm what the other denies. The one affirms that nothing can be obligatory which transcends the powers of our nature and constitution. The examples given by the writer are that a rational act cannot be required of an irrational animal, nor a man be required to transport himself to heaven. The other simply denies that adequate power, or, as it is explained, the power of the will, is the measure of obligation. For example, it is not necessary that a man should be able to change his affections at will in order to his being responsible for them. The object of the writer is thus distinctly stated. Quote, the maxim, he says, that obligation to obey a command supposes the existence of an ability to do the act required relates entirely to actions consequent on volitions. Man, he says further, cannot alter the perceptions of sense, he cannot excite affections to any objects at will. We utterly deny, he adds, that in order to a man's being accountable and culpable for enmity to God, he should have the power of instantly changing his enmity to love. End quote. Where is now the contradiction between the repertory of 1831 and the repertory of 1851? And where is now our author's self-respect? On page 630, he goes still further back and quotes from the repertory of 1830 the proposition, quote, The loss of original righteousness and corruption of nature are penal evils, end quote. Whereas in another place, the repertory says, quote, We do not teach, however, that sin is the punishment of sin, end quote. Professor Park asks, quote, What are we to believe? Now, original sin is a penal evil, but then we do not teach that sin is penal, end quote. Taken in their connection, these propositions are perfectly consistent. It is a common objection to the doctrine of original sin that it represents sin to be the punishment of sin. To this it is answered that if this means either that God causes men to commit one sin as a punishment for having committed another, or that he infuses evil principles into men's hearts as a punishment of their own, or of Adam's sin, then we deny that sin is the punishment of sin. As these are the senses in which objectors are wont to use the expression, it is perfectly proper and perfectly intelligible to deny that we teach what they charge upon us when they say sin is the punishment of sin. On the other hand, it is perfectly intelligible and perfectly correct to express the idea that original sin is the certain consequence of God's judicial abandonment of our race by saying it is a penal evil. Paul teaches, Romans 1.24, that God judicially abandons men to uncleanness and that immorality is a punishment of impiety. In this sense, sin is the punishment of sin. But in the sense that God causes men to sin or infuses sin into them, as objectors say, sin is not the punishment of sin. Cannot our author understand this? The Bible says God does not tempt men. In other places it says he does tempt them. The Apostle says the heathen know God, and in another place that they do not know him. What would be thought of a sceptic who should try to overthrow the authority of Scripture by parading such verbal contradictions as contradictions in doctrine? 
Again, the denial that nature, in the sense of essence, is or can be sinful is represented as contradicting the assertion that nature, in the sense of moral disposition, can have a moral character. And the assertion that the Augustinian system characteristically exalts the sovereignty of God is inconsistent with saying that the opposite system represents the law of God, in the pardon of sinners as being set aside by a sovereign act. In view of such contradictions, Professor Park asks, quote, what will this gentleman say next? End quote. Why, he says he would just as soon spend his time picking up pins as in answering such objections as these, of which we would say, in the language of feeling, there must be some hundreds in our author's two articles. There is another class of these arguments ad hominem. There are certain familiar facts and principles which lend an air of plausibility to our author's theory, and which we were careful to distinguish from it. We admitted that figurative language and the language of emotion were not to be pressed unduly, that true believers agree much more nearly in their inward faith than in their written creeds, that the mind often passes from one state to another, at one time receiving as true what at another it regards as false. When, in his search for contradictions, the author finds in our pages the acknowledgment of such truths as these, he brings them forward with exaltation as the very doctrine of his sermon. He quotes, for example, the following passage from the Biblical Repertory, volume 20, page 140. Quote, there is a region a little lower than the head, and a little deeper than the reach of speculation, in which those who think they differ, or differ in thinking, may yet rejoice in Christian fellowship. End quote. On page 598 of his present article, he says, quote, Lest our reviewer suspect this remark of Germanism, let him have the goodness to re-peruse his own saying, this is a doctrine which can only be held as a theory. It is in conflict with the most intimate moral convictions of men. And further, it is the product of the mere understanding, and does violence to the instinctive moral judgments of men. And still further, even among those who make theology their study, there is often one form of doctrine for speculation, another simpler and truer for the closet. Metaphysical distinctions are forgotten in prayer, and under the pressure of real conviction of sin, and need of pardon, and of divine assistance. Hence it is that the devotional writings of Christians agree far more than their creeds. End quote. We can almost pardon our author, considering the straits to which he is reduced, for quoting these passages as agreeing with the doctrine of his sermon. The difference between them is, however, we are sorry to say, essential. It is a familiar fact of consciousness and observation that faith is sometimes determined by the understanding, and sometimes by the inward experience and instinctive laws of our nature. It is also a familiar fact that the convictions produced by the considerations presented by the understanding give way when those considerations pass from the view of the mind, and it is brought under the influence of the feelings and the common laws of belief. Thus a man may be a sincere idealist, so long as the metaphysical arguments in favour of the system are before the mind, but as soon as the attention is withdrawn from those arguments, and the mind is brought under ordinary influences, he believes in the external world as truly as other men. Thus too a man puzzled with the difficulties which beset certain doctrines, or controlled by his philosophical theories, may be a sincere Arminian, or he may really believe that responsibility is limited by ability, that he has no sin in him but his acts, and that he can change his heart by a volition. But when these theories are absent, and the mind is brought into contact with the simple word of God, or governed in its conviction by the inward teachings of the Spirit, he can adopt all the language of David or Augustine. Still further, it is not uncommon to meet with experiences similar to that of Schleiermacher. He was educated as a Moravian, but became addicted to a pantheistic form of philosophy, and wrote a system of divinity, which such men as Hengstenberg regard as subverting some of the essential doctrines of the gospel. Yet he often relapsed into his former faith, and thought, felt, acted, and, it is hoped, died as a Moravian. All this is true, and this, and nothing more than this, is contained in the extracts quoted by Professor Park from our pages. Has any one before our author ever inferred from these facts that idealism and materialism are different modes of one and the same philosophy, or that Arminianism and Calvinism, Moravianism and Pantheism are but different forms of one and the same theology? 
let it be remembered that Professor Park proposes to reconcile all allowable creeds, that he proposes to do this by his theory of two theologies, the one of the intellect and the other of the feelings, distinguished not as true and false, but as, quote, one system of truths exhibited in two modes, end quote that he applies his method ex professo to harmonizing the Augustinian and anti-Augustinian systems, and in the article under consideration, applies his principles to the case of imputed and involuntary sin, for this reason, among others, quote, that it is more difficult to reconcile the New England and the old Calvinism on these subjects than on any other, end quote. Is there not a difference between Professor Park and ourselves? Is there not a difference between saying that pious men, when not speculating, think and feel very much alike, and saying that conflicting creeds are one system of truths presented in different modes? Whether Professor Park has come to this conclusion by the same steps as the German theologians or not, the fact is clear that the conclusion is the same. Their theory is, Christianity is a life and not a doctrine. Their conclusion is that this life manifests itself in different theologies, which differ not as true and false, but as the same system of truths in different modes. He says it is, quote, an unworthy attempt, end quote, on our part to link his sermon with the German theology. We expressly and repeatedly stated we intended no such thing, though we are free to confess it appears to us more respectable to take the theory with the conclusion than to take the conclusion without the theory. We would far rather adopt the Schleiermacher doctrine on this subject out and out than the principle which, to so great an extent, pervades Professor Park's articles of teaching error in the established formulas of truth. Footnote. This, after all, appears to us the most objectionable feature of this whole theory, that it justifies the use of language out of its established sense. Professor Park has openly avowed that there is scarcely any form of expressing old-school doctrines which he could not adopt. End footnote. We begin to suspect that when our author wrote his convention sermon, he had no developed theory whatever. There probably floated in his mind the simple principles that men often say things in an excited state of the feelings which mean more than their sober judgment can approve, that good people agree much nearer in experience than in their creeds, and that a man often changes his faith with his varying states of mind, and he thought he could, out of those principles, construct a scheme of union of allowable creeds, and do away with the inconvenient distinction of sound and unsound theology. But in the excitement of the work, his Pegasus ran away with him, and carried him over into the German camp, and when a friendly hand rouses him up, and tells him where he has got to, he insists he is still safe at home. There is another feature of Professor Park's mode of conducting this discussion which is very little to our taste. He constantly endeavours to represent us as assailing New England theology. This is a ruse de guerre, every way unworthy of a candid disputant. We stated as the three radical principles of the anti-Augustinian system, quote, first, that all sin consists in sinning, that there can be no moral character but in moral acts. Secondly, that the power to the contrary is essential to free agency, that a free agent may always act contrary to any influence not destructive of his freedom, which can be brought to bear upon him, and thirdly, that ability limits responsibility, that men are responsible only so far as they have adequate power to do what is required of them, or that they are responsible for nothing not under the control of the will." End quote. If there is one characteristic of New England theology more prominent than any other, it is opposition to these principles. The worldwide fame of President Edwards as a theologian rests mainly on his thorough refutation of them in the works we have already referred to. In this opposition, Bellamy, Dwight, and the other great men of New England were no less strenuous than Edwards. The aberration of the advocates of the exercise scheme though it led them to a denial of at least the first of the above principles, was in the direction of ultra-Calvinism. It was not until the rise of what is popularly called New Havenism that these principles were rejected by any other class of New England divines reputed orthodox. It is Professor Park, and not we, who is the assailant of New England theology, a fact which he will not be able to conceal. We recently heard of certain Unitarian gentlemen who seemed honestly to believe that Trinitarianism is dying out in this country. 
It is possible that a similar hallucination may lead Professor Park to regard the little coterie to which he belongs as all New England. Again, there is not in the long article under consideration any frank and manly discussion of principles. His great object seems to be to elude pursuit by a copious effusion of ink. We had two leading objects in our late review. The one was to state clearly what it was our author proposed to accomplish and the other was to examine the means by which he endeavoured to attain his end. We endeavoured to show that the task which he undertook was to reconcile the two great conflicting systems of theology, the Augustinian and the anti-Augustinian, and then we endeavoured to set forth the theory under its different aspects by which this reconciliation was to be effected. If he intended his comments to be an answer to our review, it was incumbent upon him to take up these points. He should have proved either that we had not fairly presented the two systems of theology referred to, or that they were not included under his category of allowable creeds. Or, if satisfied as to these points, he should have shown either that we misapprehended his theory, or that that theory was philosophically true. So far as we can discover, he has hardly made a show of attempting to accomplish any one of these objects. We therefore do not feel it necessary to pursue the subject any further. If, on the other hand, our author did not intend his comments as an answer, we have, of course, nothing to say. In either case, we remain unanswered. We hope the reasons above given will satisfy our friends of the propriety of our discontinuing this discussion. We have one other, which we trust we may present without offence. It is a common remark that a man never writes anything well for which he has to read up. Professor Park has evidently laboured under this disadvantage. Old-school theology is a new field to him, and though he quotes freely authors of whom we, though natives, never heard, yet he is not at home, and unavoidably falls into the mistakes which foreigners cannot fail to commit in a strange land. He does not understand the language. He finds out, quote, five meanings of imputation, end quote. It would be wearisome work to set such a stranger right at every step. We would fain part with our author on good terms, we admire his abilities and are ready to defer to him in his own department. But when he undertakes to teach old-school men old-school theology, it is very much like a Frenchman teaching an Englishman how to pronounce English. With the best intentions, the amiable Gaul would be sure to make sad work with the dental aspirations. End of section 32 End of Essays and Reviews by Charles Hodge